On today's episode of Kilts and Culture with USA Kilts, we try Open Single Malt Scotch 18 Year. And don't mind the fact that the bottle's a little empty. <laughs> Howdy, boys and girls. Welcome to Kilts and Culture. I am Rocky. This is not Eric. It is Ian. Uh, for those wondering, Eric is still alive. Oh, he's not. Okay. <laughs> he's still. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> no, today, he actually had a uh, an event to do with his son, now a fishing thing to do with his son. So he is not here today. But Ian has graciously graced us with his presence. You're stuck with me again. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, and as usual, Mr. Mac behind the other camera over there. Ta-da. Maybe, if he did. There I am. Oh, down there, yeah. Okay, <laughs> indeed, that's Mac. <clears throat> Wearing his Piper Alley shirt today. Mm -hmm. Very, very nice, very, very, mm -hmm. very, uh, I don't know what it is, very, very nice, very pretty. It's, I'm very that's jealous. Very orange. Very orange, yes, that's mm -hmm. what I was looking for. Fair. Okay, today, boys and girls, special treat. Oban single malt whiskey. This is the 18 year limited edition. Um, this was given to us, gifted to us by a, uh, a friend of ours and fan of the show, David Kemp. He is down under. My man's down in Australia. Um, hopefully he's watching right now. If not, he may be catching on the rerun. Um, but he's a really, really cool guy. Done a lot of really cool stuff with us. Um, and then surprised us with two bottles of scotch. But yep. what's your freaking spectacular looking. Um, I may I or may not have have broken into this already, um, not wanting to wait for a review because I like Oban and it's 18 years, so it cannot be bad. I, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. So. <laughs> I, I haven't will, tried it yet though, oh, so it should be fresh for me. I forgot to do the special thing. Whoops, okay. Oh, oh. oh special effects, <laughs> kind of. That was really expensive. The, we spent yeah. thousands of dollars working on that tech. The, the not so special special effects. All right, Mr. Mac, while I am Pouring said scotch whiskey, if you could. No, 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 you're supposed to read the tasting, that's why I'm pouring it. Oh, 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 oh heavens. Something. All right, back in my chair. Well, I've poured it all now so you can come get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back. That's delicious. All right, I know we're, I know we're all gonna like it, so I'm gonna pour a little bit extra. <laughs> Right. I do have to drive home. <laughs> <laughs> Sleeping at the shop. All right, Mr. Mac, that's yours. Mm -hmm. um, my and air we mattress. will. <laughs> and my cot. Um, all right, we will do our. Oh, I can't really see my kilt too much. All right, what tartan are you wearing today, Mr. Mac? I, I have uh, Stuart Hunting Ancient on today. Very pretty. I like the orange. How it matches mm -hmm. the shirt. Orange. Yep. Mac, you got orange in the hat too. Mac is very nice. Mm -hmm. You probably have orange in your socks. No, I got blue no. in my socks. Blue today. in the socks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you got blue <laughs> in the kill. Mac will mm -hmm. match everything. He is. He takes matchy matchy to a different level. Oh yeah. Exactly. All right, Mr. Ian, what are you wearing today? Of course, the kilts and culture tartan. That's very nice. You look very mm -hmm. dapper today. Thank very you. dapper. Thank so we got you. like the three levels. Yes. Black matching of, the yeah. kilt as well. Very nice. Today you can't see much of it there, but. I have on my Pennsylvania State Seal Tartan based on the uh, colors in the State Seal of Pennsylvania. So that's what we're wearing today. Um, all right, all right, go back to town. Tell us about the tasting dope stuff. Hurry, 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 go quick. I, I said now. Heavens. Ooh. It smells good. It does. It smells good. All right. So. It's a little, a little sweet. So what are you getting in the oaky. scent? Are you getting some peat smoke? Some spicy wood. A touch. A Notes touch. of ripe banana. Oh, yeah, that's the sweetness. That's Pear the sweetness. and plum. Yeah, that's the sweetness. Hmm. I don't know if I'm getting banana. I, I get banana when I was up. <laughs> Matt gets banana when his throat closes yeah. up and he can't breathe. <laughs> yeah. That's this why is I said. It's going to be a very short show. <laughs> that's why I said earlier, I'm like, I don't know about this one. <laughs> uh, for, for those who don't know, yeah. Mac is allergic to banana. Yeah, um, really weird. Random. Yes. Um,. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. I noticed it more when I was up there when you were when it was poured. Right. I could smell more of that than I than I do now. So when you were a little further away. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds great. Oh, I love it. Okay. All right. Sippy sip. So the the palate is a mouth filling. Sweetness tempered with smoke and malt dryness. 
you're leading the witness, but yes, um, it's got, it's got like a, uh, after you swallow has like a little bit of a sandpapery feel on the tongue yeah. kind of thing. Um, so I feel that the, it's, it's, it's smoky, but like a, a hint. Yeah. It's not a lot. It's not overpowering. It's not like a full on Isla, like Lagavulin no. or, or Ardbeg or something like that. It's a good, like, it's just there. It's more you just balanced. see it. Yes. Than one of those. And it, it says, for the finish, long and sweet, hints of dark chocolate and salted caramel. Yeah. I get all that. Mm-hmm. It's still it's still lingering. Okay. Still Again, I think he's leading the witness because I am I 100% see it. It's, what I notice is it's not a list of tasting notes like a half mile no, long. No, it's not. It's. Short, sweet, and to the point, and I agree with everything that you just said. I don't know that I have a refined enough palate to pull all that out of it. It's, but I don't, if you think about it, now everyone's palate is different, and you're going to get different things out of it, but it's not like he said, you know, oh, it tastes like, you know, dirt, and you're like, nope, that's no dirt at all. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, Mm -hmm. you're not completely disagreeing. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we're not getting the... Can't rule the, out any of those things. The vanilla, the spice, the fruit, like the 87 typical flavors. Stuff and, like, stuff and got all the things... I'm sorry. One you. of the things I said about the body, it's a medium-bodied with rich and rich with good legs is how it's phrased on the site. I, well, I legs, feel... legs are the, the runners down the side, and yeah, it looks like streaks down the side of your glass. Those are the legs. Okay. I feel that energy. On, on that part of the description. It's, it's, it's balanced to me. It's got all the things I'm looking for. It's got that alcoholic burn. It's got the oakiness. It's got a l- little bit of spiciness, a little bit of sweetness, but nothing like the Lagavulin that has that Band-Aid flavor you talk about. Yeah. It doesn't have anything that really, like, clobbers you. And uh, uh, I agree. And it's, I will say, the only thing that I, what you just said that I did not hear Max say in the notes was I, I definitely get spiciness a little bit as well. Mm-hmm. Um like middle back of my tongue kind of oh, area. Let me try again. Yeah, all right, I'll try it again. Hold on. When he first talked about the initial notes, he did say something about the spice, about the scent. Talked about spiciness, didn't we? Or did no, you no. say that? Spicy is not generally a a, a nosing note. It's a taste. Mm-hmm. It is in the nosing. And it says peat smoke and spicy wood. Yes, remember that. Okay. Spicy okay. wood. Spicy wood. Uh, it's a spicy wood. <laughs> spicy uh, wood. The Rocky Rager story. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna leave that one alone. The uh, no, but it's it is a none of it is. Uh, now I'm gonna compare it for a sec to Highland Park, okay. um, where their tagline, and I love this tagline, which is why I'm remembering it, is intensely balanced. I think it's called intensely. It's intensely balanced. I think it's what it said. Um, but like, it's all of the flavor profiles just more intense, but on a good balance. Yeah. This is to me medium balanced. Mm-hmm. It's not like super intense. Everything is off the scale. It's not super subtle that you're like, I don't get any of this. It's kind of just a regular bland blah. Um, it's a good like right down the middle, smooth. Yeah, it's definitely smooth. Yeah, um, yeah. This is dangerous. Yeah, this this could be a problem. <laughs> We might, have to cut the, subjective. we might have to cut the show short by half an hour is all I'm saying. I, I don't know. We have uh, <laughs> Before we say David things. Gray put, uh, you guys are, ex- are expensive. You make me want to buy, uh, you make me want to drink good whiskey and wear quality kilts. <laughs> we've, we've done some less expensive whiskeys this year. <laughs> no, I will say this. We didn't buy this. I, I'm not, this, we looked it up just, you're not supposed to look up the price of gifts, but I did just because for, for reference well, on the was, show. It was right next to the tasting notes. That's, that's yes, how we Yes, of course, of course. Yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> this isn't cheap. It's a damn good bottle of scotch. Like, flavor and, and quality-wise, as well as price-wise. I think it was like 150-ish ish dollars. So it's, I like it. I wouldn't necessarily buy it for myself because I'm too cheap, but it is a damn good bottle of scotch. Yes, I agree. Yeah. All right. I think Highland now, Park is more my uh, my price range, but <laughs> yeah, Highland Park is still good. It yeah. is. It is. I don't disagree. But I'm going to pour a little bit of water just to see what it does. Okay. Um, I gave you a bottle of water earlier. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's still there or not. It is. Just a, just a touch. We'll see if it um, like cuts it or mellows it out at all. <laughs> Max got like a gallon and a half of water or whatever. Is 
spiciness comes out a little bit more in the nose, I think. A little water added. Yeah, that's weird. Water usually takes the spiciness mm -hmm. away. But yeah. it's definitely a little spicier even in in tasting it. Yeah. I think I would I would do this one neat. It's my recommendation. I don't disagree I, with I that. I don't want it quite as spicy. I like yeah. the uh, intensely medium balanced or however you described it. So is this uh, a Highland Scotch or is this a space side? Uh, no, I think it's a I think or it's other? considered an Isla, I think. Is it? Okay. Um it's over it's not on Isla or it, it, Mac, do you know what it's considered? Um Oven is on right the now. left coast of Scotland, like left of Gla or west coast of Scotland, left, left of Glasgow. Of coast, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a it's a sea town. Um I've been there. I've been there before I was really drinking scotch, or else I would have gone to the distiller. Um doesn't say. It's just a single one. West, I was excited to see a recent West looked, Highland. Recent looking a map that showed where all the biggest distilleries were in Scotland. Yeah. I was excited to see three scotches that I've always kind of like thought of as at least very close to the same. We're all like right in the same town on that island. Oh yeah, yeah. It was a uh, you know Ardbeg, Lug, Froig, and Lagavulin. Those are the three. Yep. So this is not a different <laughs> part of that island. Yeah. No, okay. no, no, no. This is not on that island. It's, it's not. Okay. It's, it says West Highland Scotch. West Highland. So Scotch. West Highland, born and raised. <laughs> <laughs> on the playground. In the peat box. Oh, in in uh, uh, yes. Um, Don't bring this to the playground. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it, it's saying it's one of the smallest uh, distilleries too. Hmm. Really? Interesting. Yeah. Well, I would think the smallest distillery. Well, one of the smallest the Scotch distilleries. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Very nice. No, but damn good. Very good. I don't think yeah. I've ever had any version of Open before, so this is exciting. I've had. I think they have a ten or a twelve year. I think is what it is, um, and it's it's really good as well. Um, I believe it, Mr. Mac. What are your score? One to ten. What do we give it? I'm gonna go. I. I'm gonna go nine one. Okay. I like this one. Strong score. Strong mm. score. Very good, Ian. This is no smoke hat. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> this could be a problem. Uh, this is good. It's very smooth. Like I could drink a lot of it without noticing kind of thing just because it's so well balanced. Uh, I like it quite a bit. I'm going to say nine, and I'm probably only rating it that low because I want to leave some room in case we try something better further down the road. Uh, but this is definitely the best thing I've ever had on the show, at least. Okay. Okay. Nine, two. Okay. It's... It's good. I like it a lot. I like it more than I should. Um, <laughs> yeah, Oban, you've kicked ass with this one. They were they were waiting for our approval, of course. <laughs> of course, of course. course. Now they've got um, the USA kilt stamp of approval, or the kilt culture stamp of approval. Exactly. It's but yeah, that's that's really really good. That may that may displace. <laughs> Got to take a breath before I say this. <laughs> okay, hold. On. This may displace Lockable. Oh, okay. I never my, thought I'd hear you say that. As, as my tastes have evolved, <clears throat> I've mellowed a little bit more. I've appreciated other scotches from other areas more. Um, so this still has like the the Lagavulin soul in a Highland body. Okay. I don't know if what I'm saying makes sense or it just sounds creepy or artistic or all of the above. I mean, um, you can be both creepy and artistic. Those things are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> I've been called both. <laughs> so, that's fair. All right. Very good. All right, boys and girls. Run, do not walk. Get a bottle of this. Save up for a while. But get a, <laughs> but get a bottle of this. It belongs in everyone's liquor cabinet at some point if you drink scotch. Or I have a friend from Darwin, Australia who sends you things. Yeah. I mean, you could buy gas or you could buy a bottle of that. Which is good. <laughs> Costs about what a tank of gas costs now. So. Would gas get you... Uh, never mind. <laughs> I'm not suggesting drinking gas. Again. Uh, the lawsuit was an influence. Okay. All right, boys and girls. Uh, load your, your comments and questions in the comment area. Um, let us know what questions you have for us. Before we get started, we are going to read... Glad that didn't rip. The answers... <laughs> We were supposed to do this last month. We biffed, completely forgot it. But at the end of the show, we always ask a question of the day. 
So, and then we just started doing this now. Well, this is the first time we're doing it. Um, we're going to revisit last month's question of the day, and we're going to read the top three answers as judged by us. So it's just random top three. Because we felt things. like it. Exactly. Or we agree with them. Um, all right. So question of the question of the day last month. What is your favorite and least favorite scotch? Yodan Hunter said his favorite scotch what his favorite scotch was Akintosh in 12 year. Least favorite Ardbeg Wee Beastie. I Dustin I think I've had them I've had Akintosh and I know we've done it on the show. Mm -hmm. I think I had Ardbeg Wee Beastie. I think my, my father in law has drank that one before. Never done the Wee Beastie. Um meh. Um Dustin Whitaker. <clears throat> I don't think Log of One Sixteen can be beat. Mm. Maybe. Mm. Um, and Cuddy Sark is pretty terrible. Yes. All accurate. Yes, it is. Um, Marcel Gomes Gomez. No idea. Um, Scotch. My favorite might be Oban. And Good the choice. only one that I had that was too smoky for me was Ardbeg. It tasted like a tire fire. Creative. Like the comment. That's our winner. Artistic and creepy. Exactly. Artistic <laughs> and creepy. Um, okay. Mr. Ian, what do we got for this month as people load in questions for Mac? Yeah, of course, get your questions in in advance. If you're not in the Kilts and Culture group, join us there. Uh, Eric always asks the question like, hey, give us some questions. That's where some of mine are coming from. Um, that's the best place if you're wondering where to send your questions. Uh, let's start with a question from Carol Boyd, though. They want to know, how do you store multiple kilts? In this case, possibly as many as 30. Um, you have a problem, Carol. Um, they apparently heard a crash in their closet and found the whole clothes rack had collapsed. Has this ever happened to you? Never. Never happened to me at all. Absolutely it has. Um, the uh, Several years ago, I guess about five or six years ago now, um, middle of the night, it heard a boom. Woke up in the morning and... The, the, the cheap wire bracky stuff that was put in there by the contractor in our walk-in closet had collapsed under the weight of a few too many kilts, perhaps. <laughs> um, so what I did, um, I'm, I'm not super duper handy, but I'm not not handy. So we went to Home Depot, bought a bunch of the, the, the metal track things with like the dual slots that kind of go down it, um, and bought a ton of that stuff and found all the studs in the closet and just screwed one into each stud. Um, I overbuilt the hell out of it. I put like, you know, three or four or five screws in each one just to make sure it's going nowhere. I may have gone too far in a few places. I haven't had a problem since. So yeah, it's, it's a bit of a DIY project. I think it cost me like six or 700 bucks between all the fancy doodads that we got from the closet. Um, but it's not going anywhere. You? Yes, first time this happened to me was probably like maybe a month out of college. My wife and I, well, she wasn't my wife at the time, but we moved into our first apartment together. Moved in that day, middle of the night, I heard a noise. I, I flew out of our bedroom in our small one bedroom apartment, like fists up, ready to fight somebody. I thought somebody had crashed through our front door. And you know, new apartment, don't know the neighbors, don't know, yeah. like, don't know what's going on. Um, it's a small apartment, I quickly evaluate, I'm like, there's, no, there's nothing different. There's nothing wrong, the door's closed, it's still locked bathroom's fine none of our you know boxes of piles of boxes have fallen over just went back to bed confused no idea what had happened it was in the morning when i got ready to go to work and open the closet i'm like oh i see what happened here That's what that is. Yeah. <laughs> now i was one month out of like college so i did not have six or seven hundred dollars for a solution also it was an apartment and i yeah. wasn't trying to spend no. a lot of money to no. fix up this one bedroom apartment that we only ended up staying in for like eight months um, I got a two by four and it was one of those cheap uh, closet rods that like yep. fits like a wide range. So like right at the point where the two rods becomes With one, a joint. Yeah. it collapsed there. So two by four, propping that up. I don't know if I put in a new, I might've put in a new bar if it was damaged and then propped it up with a two by four. And that happened through a couple different apartments. Um, after that, I moved into an old home that had very sturdy ones. Um, but yeah, my recommendation for those of you who are just getting into the serial kilter lifestyle Invest in your closet and space now. Even if it's just like you get some old pipe at the hardware store and some really good brackets. Yeah, yeah, like galvanized piping like plumbers are using that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah, it is. Not a bad plan. It can be a problem. I was going to say the same thing. Support it from the bottom mm -hmm. if you don't want to redo the whole the whole closet kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Mac, has anything like that happened to you? Or 
No. Has your closet been pristine? <clears throat> Every uh, the apartment we lived in was very small closets, and they weren't very wide. Hmm. So therefore, I did not have space in the closet for thirty kilts. <laughs> So I was not allowed to use the closet. <laughs> <laughs> not for thirty kilts, for anything. <laughs> yes, yes, I was that my I was booted from the room, and that somebody else had had uh, closet space. Um, but we did set up like one of those, like a rolly rack type thing, but it was plastic and it lasted about three seconds. And yeah, so yeah, the, cheap ones don't last well. Yeah, so now now I've got a, a heavy heavy metal almost just pipe in our house that we bought yeah um and it i don't have a i don't have a problem right now so yeah overbuild yeah yep so i've been noticing recently we've been getting a lot more of this type of question just from customers in the store not even necessarily for the show and i have a theory on this i think a lot of people discovered <clears throat> this lifestyle during pandemic whether it's through our show or just doing their dna and just and you know getting into kilts from there and so a lot of people have gone from maybe having one kilt to now having several. So this is a problem that I'm seeing more and more, like specifically like 2022 even. Kilts. So A, I think you give our show too much credit. B, <laughs> I think it, I think it has done something for tens of people. People going from wearing their kilts two or three times a year and owning one or two to it's encouraging the serial kilter. Often. Correct. Yeah. Understood. Um, yeah. Yes, I agree. I think it's more, um, much more to do with um, what you said. You know, researching your family lineage, you know, finally having some time and, you know, you're stuck at home, you're playing around on the computer. Hey, you might as well, you know, call grandma and see about her childhood and fill in the thing on the, the family tree and on Ancestry.com or whatever. Yeah. I think that's... Or they're doing the tests. Probably has tests. something to do with it as well. I agree. All right, Mr. Mac, do we have anyone? Is there anybody out there? Um, any questions from the audience? We've, uh, we've got a few coming in. I'm catching up on all the comments now. Um, I'm gonna be making more comments when I pour another pint of this stuff. A mega pint. And and what and what uh what is that again? This is Oban 18. Um, damn, that's good. <laughs> Rocky's like, nope. <laughs> Get some cheap shit from the back. <laughs> Sorry, smokehead's gone, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness. Whew. So we have Kendrick asking. What would you say is the most camouflage? Holy. <laughs> I was joking about a pint. Yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> I, I pinch more than you. Mine wasn't empty, though, yet. So that, it, was okay. the same, it was the same okay. pour. It was the same pour. Sure. We can go back and review the footage if you <laughs> want to. <laughs> All right, Mac, what were you saying? All right, so we got Kendrick asking well, from YouTube, what would you say is the most camouflage tartan or one that its colors could function as such, other than Black Watch, and even even that's iffy, as he's saying. I have one in mind. Shadow Tartan, black on black. You could do that. You could do, um, I would say, something in the Weathered family, um, possibly Black Watch Weathered, or, no, no, I wouldn't say camouflage on that because there's too many bright yeah. things. Yeah. But like Mackay weathered. Do you get the weathered vibe here? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's weathered. But Mackay weathered is going to be just effect effectively charcoal <laughs> and then gray and brown, and that's it. Yeah. Um, so those would be my camouflage ones. If you're going to be in the fall in Canada, maple leaf, it's meant to kind of, you know, represent the gradient. Um, Ian. I don't think there's going to be any, like, great knock-it-out-of-the-park answers to this question because of all the straight lines. It's very... Yes. Insert your word here. Gridular. Gridular. Exactly. Um, so the straight lines are going to stand out against a background that isn't that straight. So uh, I think it depends on the time of year, too, as you were kind of indicating. I think, like, a Buchanan muted, like it's available in the PV range, would look good in the fall for, you know, blending okay. in with the oranges and the, the greens and everything going on. It's the first one that comes to mind for that. Um, County Roscommon isn't too far off of that. I think the Buchanan's a little better for blending in, though. Okay. For the fall. Mac? So if I'm, if I'm going fall, um, I was thinking the... Um, not Isle of Man. Uh, uh, Collins of Sky. Oh. Okay. Um, kind of, it kind of goes with that, that whole like maple leaf look <clears throat> to it. Okay. But I was taking the camouflage, like old school camo, like brown watch or um, okay. or Buchanan 
hunting the okay or some of the tweeds. Yeah, yeah. like I was trying to think that. It's supposed to be some natural fiber. Stuart hunting weathered tweed mm-hmm. is yeah. It get, it gets at least it sort of tampens down the straight line thing with a little bit of texture look to it. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Can depend okay. on where you are too, though. Like uh, perhaps a uh, saffron kilt if you're out in the desert. <laughs> Unless you're the same color as the sand, I don't think it's going to work. Yeah, but I mean, just, what's going to be sure. better out in the desert, though? You know, I don't know. <laughs> just want to make sure you have the uh, blaze orange vest to, to go with this, though. <laughs> <laughs> or on where a you Piper go, Alley course. shirt. There we go. That works, too. <laughs> in blaze orange. It's not quite fluorescent enough. <laughs> yeah, it's fair. It's not flyers orange, but, you know, it's mm-hmm. like a burnt sienna. <laughs> mm-hmm. Fair. A, a, a light pumpkin. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yes. We, we it's called a jack o' lantern. <laughs> the light pumpkin. <laughs> oh my god! This is going to get worse. That's how I got folks. kicked off the show. Yes. <laughs> Why isn't he on the show anymore? <laughs> All right. I hope that answer helped. Sorry for him. All right. Next question, Mr. Ian. Okay, I've got one here from our friend down in Florida, Brian Taylor. Uh, he has a large remnant from when his kilt was made, about 30 by 60 inches. Um, I want to make some other things with it. Do you tear or rip, or do you tear slash rip, or do you cut it? The, uh, depends on 30 by 60. I would say this, if he was, with tartan, with any twill kind of fabric, you can actually tear it. So you cut a two inch section, you grab either side, and I'm going to do this without the scotch in my hands, you grab either side and pull hard and fast apart with your hands. And the fabric will rip in a straight line right down that, you know, that section. Um, if you are, if you're cutting or you're trying to cut a shorter section, tw- 20 inches or less, I'd probably, you know, kind of ballpark or 15 inches or less, I wouldn't rip it. I would just cut it. Um, because if you, if you rip too slow, what ends up happening is you pull and you have a bunch of little pulls in the fabric. You have to rip hard and fast. Um, so for that, if especially if he's going down the 60 inch length, like he's cutting, you know, 60 inch strips, then sure, I would, you know, notch it and then rip real fast. Would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely don't want to do it too close to any edges, obviously, but yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. so that would be my answer to that. Okay, and Mark Rooney followed up with, and what to make from a small chunk of cloth like that, or even smaller, perhaps. Okay, so what would we make from small pieces of cloth? So our example is 30 by 60. What would you do with 30 by 60? Um, You could do (coughs) like one necktie. With a necktie, they're generally cut on the bias, so you're wasting a lot of fabric. Um, You could do pocket squares. You could do one sash spliced in the middle. Um, yeah. You could do. I'm trying to think what else. What would you. Mac, bring yourself in for this one as well. What would you make out of a small piece, small scrap ish of cloth? I, I think it. You could do. Like, if you want to accent something in your house, you could use it as a. Maybe like a ribbon around a wreath if you wanted to use a small piece of that. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or just even a little runner on a mantle or a table, um, potentially a uh, pillow. A pillow. That's probably that'd be thirty by sixty is probably only enough for one. If you had something a little bit bigger, or depending on the size of the pillow. Depending on the size of the pillow, if and if you're only back eight, or if you're backing just one side of it versus the other side. Yeah, yeah, fair point. Fair maybe point. maybe a seat on a chair if it's just a smaller chair or it's a stool. Just the pad, yeah, the seat, yeah, something like that. Um, Maybe a thong? I don't know. Maybe <laughs> wool thong. Yeah, sixteen ounce. Why not? Yeah, go in, go in, go big, go. Oh, it is a good thing I didn't just take a sip right there. <laughs> well, We're all over the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> it really lulled me to sleep with pillows and seat covers, and then boom. <laughs> thong. Okay. Thong. Fair. Fair. Assless chaps. Next level. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, what about yourself? Yeah, here in the production room, a piece like that we'd set aside for making an sashes to put out in the store. That's that's the first thing that comes to mind. 
um, if you're more crafty, maybe like if you're doing, um, I know one year we made a bunch of um, jams or something like that to give out to all our friends at Christmas, friends and family. Maybe take a little little small remnants and tie it around the jar just to give it a little personal touch, especially if it's your, if it's your family tart and it's going to family members. I agree. Um, fun little touch. When we, uh, when I wrap Christmas uh, presents, I would often take long skinny strips of tartan and then, you know, tie it around the box. Okay. So you can do that as an accent thing. Um, in the store, we used to actually tie little strips of tartan on the handle of the bags. Don't tell them don't that. Don't tell them that. Okay, then they're going to ask for Sorry. it again. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, what was the other thing I had? Um, yeah, I forget. But, yeah, those are some things. What would you guys do? If you have little bits of tartan, um, how would you use them? Oh, I know what I was going to say. Quilt. If you want to, if you're crafty and make quilts, oftentimes people say quilt and kilt, <laughs> mixing the words up. That's that's true. We do get we do get some people that will will they do take some. There's they're even doing a shadow box mm -hmm. with uh, maybe having like the if it's an Irish one, have like a county um, silhouette and have that with it or some sort of saying. We we've, we've seen seen some yeah. seen things along those lines. We've seen some things, um, <laughs> but no, there's there's a lot of cool the shirt kilts from two episodes ago. Yeah, We've seen some things. There's a lot of cool ways to uh, uh, to use tartan as an accent in either decor around your home or in in art pieces or in just you know even just wrapping presents. Just fun little ways to incorporate it and adds a splash of color and a, a bit of culture to it. Cool. Good luck, Mr. Mac. Alrighty, so we have Chris, or let's go to Robert's question. Um, Robert is asking, when wearing a PC for one's wedding, he's the groom, so congratulations. My condolences. <laughs> What's the preferred style of shirt and tie to wear? Also, is a turn down collar and tie inappropriate? Long, to, like necktie. I'm assuming necktie yeah. with that. <clears throat> with a PC, yes, unless maybe it's a five-button vest. Um, a the the appropriate shirt to wear with a Prince Charlie jacket and vest. Well, let's start here. A Prince Charlie jacket and vest comes with an an open jacket. It actually does not physically close. There's there's buttons on it, but they don't connect. A three-button vest is typically what you'll get with a Prince Charlie. Now, three-button vest meaning like it's down to here. So you have a long ways to go from the bottom of the V to your actual necktie. So wearing a straight necktie with a three-button vest is a bit, eh, I wouldn't do it. So typically it's a, a bow tie is what you wear with a PC. And uh, you would also wear a wing collar tuck shirt with a Prince Charlie jacket and vest. Now, there have been some people, it, kind of a trend over the last... Well, COVID has just thrown everything out the window <coughs> for years. But um, uh, there's been a trend over the last five or six years to start pairing a five-button, higher, you know, uh, higher five-button vest with a Prince Charlie. Something like, yeah, something like what Ian has on. Now, for that... I would not wear this vest with a Prince Charlie. No, but if it was black. Same material as the vest, or as the jacket. Um, with that you could get away with i guess a straight tie it's still not my druthers how does it um, look with a prince charlie jacket though i don't think i've seen that before it looks fun curious. well i'll get to that hold your horses buddy sorry, sorry. um the uh you could still wear a bow tie with a five button vest um you could wear a ruched tie with a five button vest um or a necktie although i'm not a big fan of a necktie with a pc because you're mixing <coughs> formal and semi-formal or less formal um the main difference between an argyle, it's called an argyle vest, um, the main difference between a standard argyle vest that you would wear with an argyle jacket and a five-button argyle vest you would wear with a PC is you would get the vest a size shorter. So if you're normally a 48 long, you'd get a 48 regular because the Prince Charlie jacket and vest is cut much higher. Hmm. So you don't want the bottom of the vest to be below the bottom of the coatee or the or the jacket, so you'd get the next size up. Is typically even even if you just ordered um, from you know from company X here, um, if you ordered a Prince Charlie jacket and five button vest, they're going to supply a shorter vest, or they should supply a shorter vest 
with the Prince Charlie than they otherwise would within within our gal. Don't give them ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Does all of that make sense to you? Do you have anything to add it, to this? It all makes enough sense. I think we're out of a little context. Like if you can visualize what Rocky was talking about with the five button vest, you're seeing this much necktie. With that three button, you're know, gonna see double or maybe even a little bit more. And yeah. it's gonna bunch up in weird ways. It's that, yeah. For that reason, it's probably not going to be the best. Yeah, it's not ideal. Yeah. Agreed. So? I don't think I have much else to add beyond that, though. Okay. That helps. <clears throat> was that you or was that Mac? Was you had Mac. one similar, I thought. Yeah. So that's why I was confused. Go ahead. Did Ian, I have one similar? you go next. Okay, I had one similar. Uh, kind of. Not exactly. PC, I not about where the it vest. Is. I wasn't going to yeah. do that one next, though. I'm you not don't. quite ready to you just start. go right down the list, Okay, buddy. I'm going to go right down the list, bud. Fair. Okay. <laughs> this is a really good scotch. <clears throat> it is. So, from our friend Mark Swan. I don't know if he's our friend. Actually, I'm not sure who Mark Swan is. He's my buddy. Of course my friend my Mike friend. Swan. My personal... Yes, my personal bestie. Bestie, Mike Swan. Mark Swan. Mark yes, Swan. <laughs> Can I have some more scotch? Um, he you says, drank it all. <laughs> he says, I'm curious about the membership process of Celtic societies. How open are they? I'm still trying to figure out my clan heritage and an organization that will accept me. I'm a rather unconventional person. Not unlike ourselves. <laughs> um, and on the younger side of the curve. 30 is apparently the curve. Uh-oh. But I'd like to be part of something that supports the culture and family vibe without it being a crowd of folks that I'm just not going to mesh with. Okay. Um, what he's talking about, the, the organizations that are involved in, in Celtic heritage and whatnot, um, range from... Uh, there, there's kind of a weird uh, concentric circle overlap kind of thing going on. Some of them are fraternal type organizations where it's more just or fraternal or social where it's just more about hanging out and drinking and you know whatever. There's some that are more educationally minded. There are some that are more um, uh, uh, altruistic or you know community minded where they actually go out and do things or they have charity, uh, or... charity exactly or they have like school. Uh, scholarship funds and that kind of thing um, and then there's a whole lot of overlap so it's not like a they most do all three to at least some degree right it's just a matter which one they emphasize <sighs> ish it depends on the individual organization Fair. like it, you could say um, masons do a lot of good out in the community um, I don't know how much education they're necessarily doing but like clan societies are all about yeah. education and not about necessarily going out and you know cleaning up litter on the side of the highway or whatever so it's there are differing things that they kind of focus on depending on the the the, the mission of the organization, if you will. Um, and there are organizations for men specifically. There are some for women specifically, and then there are some that do both. So like St. Andrew's Society, um, uh, like for instance, St. Andrew's Society of Philadelphia is a male only organization and they are reasonably exclusive i.e you have to be able to prove your scottish lineage and be able to join and i believe you have to be asked by a member in order to join versus um something like the aoh the who else ancient order of hibernians which is an irish fraternal organization um or the laoh which is essentially the the ladies equivalent ladies ancient order of hibernians um they are both gender specific. However, they're some of them are more exclusive, some of them are less. Like you either have to be Catholic for certain ones, other ones you, they may kind of wave that a little bit if you're very, very Irish and very, very involved. Um, Masons, I would kind of toss into this because there's a lot of Scottish influence in Masonic mm -hmm. stuff and the Masonic Rite, um, the or Scottish Rite, excuse me. So there's that. I'm trying to think of other organizations specifically. Clan societies, which ideally you're, you'd be part of the name, so it's kind of exclusive. But if you want to help because your wife is a Buchanan and you're not, and they're not going to turn you away at Scottish festivals. But with all these things, I imagine <clears throat> that it's going to vary potentially from region to region. Like maybe the fratern the friendly sons of St. Patrick in one city are pretty exclusive, but maybe in another city they're going to yes. be a little bit more yes. open. Um, the St. Andrew's Society, I know that certain ones, the, the, it's it's left up to the individual chapter, yeah. I guess they're chapters, on how exclusive they are, whether they say, like, no, you must 
be able to prove your Scottish lineage or, well, your wife is like off the boat Scottish and you want to join as a member. So you're allowed in mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, uh, I'm constantly reminded the Groucho Marx quote, I wouldn't belong to a club that would have me as a member. Um, so that has to fit in here somewhere. I don't want to belong to any club that will accept me as a member. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really, what organization would be best for you? We don't know because we don't know you. And you don't know because you don't know the organizations. So the best thing you can do is start looking up different organizations in your area and seeing what kind of qualifiers they have, how often they meet, what do they do, what's the mission statement, do they... What's important to you? Yeah, exactly. Well, that's what I'm saying. Look it up yeah. and then figure out where you mesh with that. Yeah. If it's uh, if it's a, a drinking club with an Irish problem, then, you know, and... And you like to under 30. <laughs> exactly. And you like to go out and party and you like to drink and you want to hang out and you're just in it for the social aspect. Fine, great. That sounds like a good one. If you want to go out there and educate people on a specific thing, then maybe you look towards like a clan society where you get to travel around to a few different festivals and actually engage with the general public and educate them on things. So, it really it depends on what your goals are, what you want to do and how you could fit in with them. Um, one of the members uh, in the, the Kilts of Culture group kind of said it sounds like essentially a, a tag along for a, an MC, a motorcycle club, where you just hang out with the club for several months to see if you're going to be a good fit, to see if you like the members, to see if you like what they're about. And then if you do and if they like you, then great, you can maybe join the club or go through the process of being a prospect and all that. Or if you decide like, eh, nah, I don't like what these guys are doing or I don't like what the, these particular people in the group or whatever, then you, you know, you just move on. You just Not do something else. That vibe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we were talking about this question yesterday and while we were talking about it, I got invited to join the Facebook group. Facebook group. Facebook grapes. Those are fun too. Uh, the Caledonian Club of Florida West. So I, I was kind of looking at well, I was curious now because I'm like, well, would I even be allowed to be a member? Um, and they basically allow anybody who's Scottish, any Scottish Americans, or anybody who's just really interested in Scottish stuff. So they'd be a pretty wide open group. Now, I don't know where yeah. Mark is. I don't know if you're in Florida or not, but um, that would be a generally wide open kind of a group. Um, a group that I've come encountered within the last few months <coughs> is the uh, Ye Enchanted Crew of Brigadoon down in Tampa Bay. They're involved in uh, Gasparilla down there and they do charitable stuff, but also seem to have a bit of a pirate problem and a Scottish problem and maybe even a drinking problem. I don't know. I don't know them that well. I shouldn't cast aspersions. Mac, what's the, <laughs> what's the group in in California that we're, that we're talking to about getting the Tartans? The, the, the uh, uh, purple logo? Yes, I'm picturing the webpage. I'm picturing... Mm. It's the... I don't want to say the... Clan Inebriated. Yes. Yes. Clan Inebriated. They go to a bunch of different festivals. I don't know how much community outreach kind of things they do, but again, that's more of a social club where it's just fun to belong and they're just all about just hanging out, good vibes, and, you know, partying. Yeah. So I kind of like that myself. Yeah, There's one of the a... things that um, uh, Jack on YouTube said is uh, Scottish country dance groups as well. There's okay. another another avenue another that this. yeah, and they're probably a lot more forgiving as far as who they would allow in as mm -hmm. a member. Um, you don't necessarily have to be Scottish as long as you like country, you know, Scottish country dancing. Yeah, no, Potential. very good point. I like that. Yeah. Potential. Um, what we'll do is when we actually clip this up and you know. Uh, uh, put it out on the YouTubes and the Facebooks later on. Um, we'll put comments or, or links in the in the comment section below or in the in the description section below, and we'll let you guys know a bunch of different groups. And if you have particular groups that you like and you th you're involved in or you just know about and they're really cool people, great. You know, let other people know about them. The more people get involved in more of the groups, the 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 more there is. It's you know, it just adds on top of itself. That was very, very eloquent of me to say it that way, I guess. And you heard it here first. Rocky says, clan societies would never go out and pick up trash. <laughs> Time to move on to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> I think these are the words you put in my mouth. There you go. <laughs> All right, Mr. Mack. Roll back the tape. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have a question coming to us from the Tickety Talks. 
whoop, 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 as the kids yes. say. So we have uh, Emery's 333 asking, when it comes to vests, would a Civil War civilian style vest work with a kilt? Mac, leave your... Well, the, the people who are actually live on TikTok can't see you right mm-hmm. now. Um, yay, technology. But what do you think? Um, is it, w- describe it so that I understand what it looks like. Double-breasted? It's it kind could of be I'm... double. It could be single. It okay. could be... There's many... Well, higher. Yeah, even higher than five. It would be like six a, or seven. Potentially. Right. Potentially not. We should um, mention, for those that don't know, Mac has done some reenacting. He's a little bit more knowledgeable in this field. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Um, so there's tons of variants with with the style of vest that it could be. It could be a shawl collar. It could be a step collar. It could be a no collar. Like it's, it's. But I'll say the bottom is also a higher rise. So because everyone's wearing their pants, your pants should be higher. Yep. Should be more around your belly button where you wear your kilt. So it would effectively be about the same level as like the vest that Ian has on. As far as height wise, like even a lot of the bottoms of some of the vests, civilian vests are even pointed like like that one. Okay. So it's there's a lot of parallels there. Yeah. So it it depends on the individual vest that you're talking about, but yes, there's a good chance it could work. Um, it, kind of what Mac alluded to. Basically, it's the bottom of the vest, how it terminates at the bottom, whether it's a flat bottom or or, or you know reverse peaks kind of thing. Um, how far down the kilt does it go? If it's cut a bit higher, then it could possibly work, or it could probably work. If it is just regular vest length, where it goes down a little bit further, like it's meant to be worn with pants of today, not you know pants of the 1800s, then yeah, it might not work. But yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be a kilt vest. You do not have to buy your vest from a kilt company. Kilt companies are going to have vests that will work with kilts, but you don't have to do it. You can find a vest somewhere else, but it's a matter of making sure that it works. The specific example that you have works with the kilt because not every vest is going to work with a kilt, but every kilt vest will. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. That's always my the thing I'm most nervous about. So it says, can I wear this vest with my kilt? Is, well, was it designed to be with a kilt because of that height issue? Yeah. So yeah, if you can work that out maybe it'll work there you go all right mr ian so i'm gonna come at you with a question we've been getting this one uh, for a couple months now haven't gotten around to it it's been on our list so several people have asked it more than i'm going to mention but i'll call out robert j barnowski eric stubbs and elliot mcfadden for recently asking this one at least what are the difference differences between woolen wool worsted wool and in the grease wool okay <clears throat> Let's start with woolen wool and worsted wool. Woolen wool, <laughs> the first time I heard the phrasing, like way back when, I thought like, oh, that's just a BS term. That can't be real. It is a real term. Woolen wool is an actual thing. Um, woolen wool is designed to be a little bit, for lack of a better term, puffier and include more air in the way that it's uh, uh, spun and then woven. So... An example of something that's wool and wool might be like an army blanket or a a, a, a pea coat or something like that, um, where it's the the air that is included in how uh, how puffy the individual strands of yarn are is an insulative property. <clears throat> Worsted wool, on the other hand, has very very long straight fibers that are very very tightly bound together in a straight fashion and it's very very densely woven it is not designed for insulative properties there's not really air pockets that are in the individual yarns but it is better for suits or kilts or garments of clothing that are a a nice garment of clothing that don't need an insulative property exactly a hard hard finish if you will now it it starts woolen wool or or worsted wool essentially start with or they could start with the same fibers it really boils down to the way that the fibers are straightened out or do you have like paddle you know paddle carters which are like two paddles where you actually do this essentially in your mind think of like the the thing you use to to uh to comb your cat to pull the excess hair off of your cat 
two of those, which you go back and forth. <clears throat> or is it a drum carter, which is essentially a drum with a bunch of little spikes coming out in all directions, and you actually spin it around, and it just kind of straightens the fibers as they go into it? Or is it combed? And combs are like big metal spikes that hold, you know, chunks of wool here, and then you actually, you know, go like this, you bat at it with another set of spikes, and then once it's all on this one, then you go sideways, and then it goes back to this one, and you're just basically straightening all the fibers. The next step is when you take the roving or like the, the puffy ball, if you will, or strip of yarn, or not of yarn, check that, of hair that you have, <clears throat> you take that, and when you go to spin it, um, if it is a short distance, a sh um, what's the terminology, Mac? Um, short, not short spinning. Um, short spin versus long spin, is that what it is? Um, short spin is you're dealing with a small amount and you're just pulling here and it's it's going right onto the spindle. So you're, you're dealing a short length versus a long where you're actually pulling it all the way out and it's actually twisting it. That is gonna give you little tiny hairs the, the long one is going to give you little tiny hairs kind of sticking out versus a short one, which is going to keep it very, very tight and very focused. So that is going to be better for worsted wool because it's tight and focused versus ones that have all the little hairs sticking out all the way down, which is going to be a little fluffier, a little airier. It's going to be better for woolen wool. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that jive? Mac, are you in the shot or no? Um, does that jive with what you've... I am now. <laughs> there you are. Um, does that jive with what you know of worsted yeah, wool versus woolen wool? Yeah, the, it just it's yeah the the airiness, the light and fluffiness of it mm -hmm. is the yeah. key. Now let's touch quickly on in the grease. In the grease basically is talking about the lanolin that's actually in the fibers themselves. So if it's in the grease, it means that it's not the 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 lanolin the the oils that are in the hair from the sheep have not purposefully been stripped all the way out so you wash wool because you know sheep are you know running around the fields they get sticks in there bugs all kinds of stuff that's the most pleasant of it I'm exactly sure. a lot of dirt <laughs> so you do have to wash that stuff out generally before you spin it however it's you don't want to wash all of it out because that helps um maintain the lanolin levels in the in the actual yarn um if it's in the grease it means that it's the lanolin has not been washed out of either the hair or the yarn if you've already done it or the finished woven fabric if it is not in the grease it means you've actually pulled and you know and stripped the lanolin out um, and there are different reasons why you want to leave it in or take it out depending on what you are doing with the finished cloth um Mac, you said something about your your parents or your mom used to do that stuff, and she would leave it in. Yeah, we'd wash it to at least get some some of the filth as it was yeah. out out of it. Because um, as you say, it's they're picking up all kinds of stuff, and you just you know as you're as you're spinning it or as she was spinning it, you know it's it, it, the more it's in the grease because you can you can literally spin right off she, like pull right off the sheep and cut it you don't spin. pull their hair <laughs> but it, it's like like the problem is it starts gunking things up the more lanolin that's in it it's gonna yeah, it's, gunk up the equipment oil. more yeah um you know and it, it's that lanolin's used can you can put the lanolin back into it as well you can add it in so and that's used for so many other properties as well yep but, does anybody yeah. use lanolin for like their own hair products or any other thing like that or you can really use moisturizer true. Oh, moisturizer, yeah, uh, lip balm, the elbows, get rid of that, you know, crustiness. Yeah, yeah. mustache wax. You, know, okay. you can use it all for that type of stuff. So yeah, in baseball mitts. I'm yeah. learning things here today. <laughs> now for a so that's in the grease. Now for a kilt, specifically, you want to look for. Generally speaking, you want to look for worsted wool fabric. You don't want to have uh, uh, woolen wool because because it has more airy insulative insulative properties. It ends up being hotter when you're wearing it. And because it's puffier type fabric, it doesn't take a crease yeah. nearly as well. Yeah. So your your the pleats on the back of the kilt are gonna end up just kind of being like rolled and just kind of limp after you wear it for a little while versus being nice crisp pleats that are gonna stay in their shape as you kind of wander about throughout the day. Any thoughts on 
woolen wool versus worsted wool kilts, why anyone would buy a woolen wool one? They're going to be less expensive. The materials are not quite as processed. Yeah. The, 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 the material itself is less expensive. And that might be where you can get into a, a less expensive kilt. But, yeah, it's yeah. just not going to hold the pleat like you said. Yeah. Agreed. Now, I think someone uh, uses the term, like, homespun or something like that. Um, <clears throat> I don't think – I think the term is misleading because it's not really I – and I don't know who it is, for the record. Um, but I've heard customers say, like, oh, what about this company? They do homespun. And it's not – homespun because it's not a little old lady sitting there spinning the actual yarn and then doing it on their own loom if it was it would be exorbitantly expensive because it's a more much much more manual process not a, a commercial process um so i think it's a little bit misleading but it's it's meant to kind of as, as a marketing thing um talk about that it's going to be imperfect there may be some slubs there may be some knots in the fabric um and to kind of prepare people that it's not going to be quite perfect because it's homespun um that's that's all i would really probably say about that any other thoughts that's all i have to say about that yeah. that's, that's all i have to say about that right where i was Pull going my out. exactly <laughs> <clears throat> no but it's yeah there's a good um it's a good question you know wool and wool Again, it sounds it sounds like a fake name, but it's not. Wool and wool is a thing. More insulative properties. It is good for certain things. It is less good for other things. It is good for pea coats and things that you need to keep warm. It is less good for finished, tailored, you know, kilts, suits, that kind of thing. Yeah. Now, would it be accurate to say, and I, I don't know the answer to this question because I'm a kilt maker with a kilt making experience. I've never done any weaving that part of the reason, in addition to the crease thing, that that you want um, not in the grease for your worsted wool for your kilts, part of that is gonna be better consistency with your chemical treatments for colors. Because you want your colors to match from bolt to bolt to bolt as much as can be reasonably expected. Possibly, I don't I don't know if the, the color, the dyeing process is affected by the, the lanolin in the actual hmm. hair. So I don't know. I don't. I think that they would probably have a if they wanted to have something that was in the grease or something that had more lanolin properties in the material. They could probably work around it. Yeah. Mac is over there intently staring I just and think, thinking. Like, greases and fats can certainly affect how like color holds. I would think. But we are firmly in speculative territory here. <laughs> don't yeah, stop yeah, and google for the like, next three um, minutes i'm thinking about like even like the scarves you have downstairs like mm -hmm. the color on some of them isn't as vibrant as like the worsted that we have in, it in, can be in though. some in some cases yeah um, but that's woolen versus worsted not in the grease versus yeah out of the grease? Um, is that that's is that a phrase no it's lamb's wool so it's going to be softer yeah a softer type of wool um so I don't think it has anything to do with in the grease or not. Okay. Yeah. The, oh, sorry for the curveball. Oh uh, yeah, there's good to be have some sort of work around around that. Yeah. Not that you couldn't get the color you wanted is not my suggestion. Yeah. Just it just, consistency. Yeah. No, I don't know how would, consistent you can make the percentage of lanolin if you're trying because to. Because lanolin's waterproof. It's <laughs> also it's a waterproofing. So it would have a little bit harder time to penetrate. Depending on how you're dying, I guess. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Yeah, I guess it would all depend on the dyeing process you're using, whether you're using a natural or using a synthetic type dye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they would well. have a dye for it, is my guess. Um, and they would, if they were going to do something like that, they would blend the uh, you know the, the fleeces from all the different sheep together yeah. and then comb them all together. So like you know, oily Betty and and dry skin Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the names of two sheep. Um, their their fleeces get kind of blended together, so it's not like one is taking the dye differently than another. Oily uh, Betty, yes. I always dread when dry Girl skin Dave comes into the store. I know. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, damn kids. All right, Mr. Mac. All right, we have Oily uh, Betty. Cameron. Whoa, whoa, Willie Betty. Whoa, 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 okay, whoa, 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 whoa
to the next question. Oh, we should do something else first. Okay, let's oh. do the Kilt Ambassador of the Month. Edward Montgomery is a veteran, teacher, and youth minister living in the panhandle of Nebraska with his wife, Carolyn. He says the culture out there is 100% cowboy since it's mainly farming and ranching. Edward goes by Monty most of the time. He and Carolyn, also a teacher, by the way, have three kids, one social worker and two college teachers. Monty flew helicopters in the Marines for seven years and participated in the invasion of Grenada and in the peacekeeping force in Lebanon. And that's why he chose Leatherneck as his first tartan, by the way. Monty's first education gig was on the Omaha Indian Reservation, teaching English and social studies, grades 6 through 12. In 2014, Monty retired, but his current school asked him to come back in 2016. And Monty, being the guy he is, said yes. The school serves a very small town, so I guess they really needed the help. He's got about 50 high school level students right now. It's a lot. Monty and his wife are going to take a stab at retiring again this May. Hopefully that'll mean more time for kayaking, biking, hiking, reading history, and practicing the boron. Those are Monty's hobbies. As for kilts, Monty had the bug for a while. He says wearing a kilt in the Montgomery Tartan was always a big bucket list for him. But serving in the Corps and then becoming a teacher really didn't lend itself to that. But he had the itch, which is what led him to the Kilts and Culture Facebook group. Ta-da! Not long after that, he was able to dive in. Even better, his school board gave him permission to wear the kilt at school. So now Monty is an official serial kilter, kilted four to six times a week. He says, It became an object lesson for my students in being a real individual and celebrating cultural heritage. Now, if you're thinking of going into teaching, Monty's advice is simple. Quote, Love your kids. If you can't love your kids on their worst day or yours, you shouldn't be a teacher. And remember, the ones who are the hardest to love are the ones who need you the most. Also, learn to buy good scotch. His advice for newbie kilters? Own it. Monty recalls that his wife once said to him, You don't like being the center of attention, but you want to wear a kilt. You need to decide. He says he bought a kilt and never looked back. So, here's to Mr. Edward Monty Montgomery, a great teacher. Cheers, Monty. So, Ian, here's my question to you. And, Mac, you can bring yourself in for this as well. I'm, I'm curious about your, your opinion on it. How would you feel, high school student, mm -hmm. you go in and one of your teachers is wearing a kilt? Is that fun? Does that inspire you? Does that, you know, make you crazy? I don't know. Like, what, what do you think? You walk into high school, one of your teachers is wearing a kilt. I mean, I, if we had a guy dressed that showed up in American Revolutionary War uniform in my school, so... Okay. I did reenacting. Regularly? No, not regularly, but it was for when we got into the, that unit. Okay. Um, so I ended up getting into reenacting, so <laughs> I would have probably had an interest in that direction. So if a teacher wore a kilt, you would have gotten into kilting instead of reenacting. You were an impressionable youth, Mac. Apparently. <laughs> I mean, I spent most of the time in the ag wing and uh, drafting wing of the building, so... Right. Okay. Ian. I I don't know. I don't know how I would have reacted to that, because I don't think... I, I wasn't ready to see that and go, oh, that's cool, I want to do that. I don't think I was there yet. Like, okay. when I was in high school, I had listened to approximately 47,000 million hours of Seamus Kennedy because my mom played it on repeat constantly in my household. I love Seamus Kennedy, but I'd had enough at that point. <laughs> you can only hear the same inter-song jokes so many times for them to still be funny. Seamus Kennedy, for those who don't know, is a Philadelphia area um, Irish musician who has his jokes. They are patent. They are pat jokes yeah. that he has on every single album, and he just repeats them, repeats them, repeats them. Wonderful man. Like amusing entertainer. I mean, I'm but... talking about him on album, so regardless whether he repeats them or not, I don't yeah. know. But fair. Um, I I was I was getting into Dropkick Murphys and flogging Molly. I don't think I would have been serious about getting into a kilt yet at that point in my life. Uh, I was watching Boondock Saints, loving that stuff. Okay. I, it was going to be a few more years before I was really open to the idea of really kind of changing my look and my lifestyle. 
Okay. So I don't, I don't, I don't know that it would have affected me directly, but it might depend on the teacher too. You know, yeah, I was definitely, I, I was definitely susceptible to like really like liking certain teachers, but not so much all of them. Yeah, I would, <laughs> I would agree. It's, it depends on the teacher. Um, I think you're, you're insightful in so far as saying that it, it depends on if you are ready for it, yeah. and in your, you're ready in your life's journey to accept like hey i should start learning about my heritage and start thinking about my family and about my mortality and about what i'm going to do and da, da, da. um most what i found is that most people get into that kind of thing mid to late 20s at the earliest some some do you know scale a little bit younger yeah. but a lot of people get into it in like the, the the bell curve is mid to late 20s yeah um and for some people not until they're retired so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's different for everybody. Yeah, I will say that, um, depending on what teacher it was, I would have at least, I probably wouldn't at that age, you know, at, at 16, 18 years old, I probably wouldn't have recognized the, I would have recognized it as a cultural thing, but I wouldn't have cared as much. Yeah. Um, I would have seen it more or processed it through the lens of individual and not caring what other people thought of him and doing what he wanted to do. And yeah. I would have respected him for that. Yes. All so that. that I would have, I would, I'd be on board with. Um, I kind of came into it um, through the dropkick Murphys type thing was what started my interest. I, I always went to Irish festivals with my parents, mm -hmm. uh, even though they're not really Irish, they're mostly German. Um, but I would do that, which kind of introduced me to some of it. And then when I could blend, you know, the traditional Irish stuff with the punk rock oi kind of music that I was into. Yeah. Or the ska music, my first, you know, full plaid kilt suit or full full plaid tartan suit. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it kind of, it was always there in the background. Yeah. But never for a, my own personal cultural heritage reason. But... It kind of it got teased out of me, and I kind of went down the path, and then just went. <laughs> yeah. So, our paths are similar in that way. It was Dropkick Murphys and uh, Boondock Saints that kind of helped me start to marry the like, cool things I was into and the things my mom the old liked. stuffy parent yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the they were fun, stuffy, good things. But, yeah, and then you know, built from there. <laughs> yes. Then he got a job here. And it was all over. All right, Mr. Mac. All right. Next question, pretty please. Okay, so we have Cameron asking, which kilt is has better longevity, adjustability wise? Um, he's in the process of losing weight. Would also like the kilt to fit as long as possible. Um, and would it make sense for him to order something slightly smaller than his measurements? Um, because of the, the adjustments sure. that we would have to go. <clears throat> so what, the first part of the question is which model would help him do this best? It says which is their style kilt that has okay. better longevity, longevity and adjustability. Okay. Sure. A um, couple things. One, when you ask a kilt maker to make you a kilt with the understanding that you are losing weight, you're asking that kilt maker to hit a moving target. Yes. It is never easy. Um, you could... You know, start your diet and then immediately fall off of the diet or just straight up plateau after week one and not really lose any weight. Um, so I would say, one, you got to commit. If you're going to say, I'm going to lose weight and I want the kilt made a little bit smaller than I am now, what I generally recommend is measure it so that it would be like on the last hole. So if the if the straps on a on a wool kilt span about three inches, and you're currently measuring let's say 45, have the last hole be 45, so the middle hole is about 43 and a half, and it can go down to about 42. So that you can at least put it on even if you don't lose weight. Correct. So when you get it, it's still going to fit you even if you don't lose one pound. The 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 more insightful thing I thought of, you know, <laughs> the more insightful thing I thought of was. I would probably get a kilt that you complete to the stripe because if you get a kilt that's pleated to the set and you lose six mm. inches, the center back of the pleat or center back of the kilt is going to be off and you're going to move the belt loops, but they may not align with where you need to move them to. 
Now the front apron is gonna go around a little bit further, but at least with pleating it to the stripe, and that's a British military trick, that's why they pleated stuff to the stripe, hmm. is so that it's easier to adjust up or down when you have the kilt done. Yeah. I will add, just, just before I get too many questions from customers, not all kilts can be adjusted by six inches. It's gonna depend on what the starting size of the kilt is. Um, I've always said it's a ratio. Yes. It's if you lose, I'm, I forget what number I said officially before. I have 10 percent ish. Yes. That's if exactly you lose about 10 percent, so you're 40, you lose 10 percent of that. It's four inches. Sure, Ball easy, park. done. If you're 60 and you lose six inches, well, let, let's say 10 to 15 percent, mm -hmm. then it's okay. If you lose, you know, 12 inches when you started at 40 and now you're down to 28, eh, it's time for a new kill. Time for a new kill. Yeah. yeah, you can usually not go up quite as much though. Usually you've got about an inch two tops to go up, depending on the exact, you know, construction of the kilt. You end up with um, the buckles on the under apron is the problem. Which, yeah, it's not going to be as strong. Um, as far as model, though, I don't think once you get to the part where you're putting the buckles on the kilt, <clears throat> after you've done all the other construction, I don't think one a five-yard versus an eight-yard matters much here. Right? Agreed. I don't even think semi-trad versus wool kilt, so polyviscose versus wool is going to affect this question too dramatically. I would say you don't have as much ability to move a, one of our casual polyviscose kilts because then you're dealing with Velcro, it's a different animal. It really kind of changes where the differences for waist and hip are built in. Um, I wouldn't move those <coughs> much at all. Can some, but not much. And I would also say this. You, ultimately, you can. You can fully adjust a kilt. If you gain 10 pounds and you, or, or uh, 20 or 40 pounds, and you want to adjust that kilt from a 50 to a 58, it can be done, but you're talking about buying more cloth, crossing your fingers, hoping that that cloth is going to match the existing cloth, which depends on, you know, the age of your kilt and that kind of stuff. And you're also talking about a major reconstruction of the garment. It can still be done. It's just going to cost you a lot of money. Wow. So what we're kind of referring to when we're talking about adjusting a kilt or moving the straps and buckles kind of thing is it, once move. you re a simple move, a yeah. simple adjustment, once you get into a, well, it really should be redone. Then you're talking about a 300 plus dollar, $400 change in a lot of construction. And at that point, your, your cost benefit analysis, um, your ROI, if you will, is you're better off selling that kilt on eBay, recouping a half to a third the cost, putting that towards a new kilt, and having one tailor-made specifically for you yes. versus ripping the whole thing apart and re-engineering it, and then crossing your fingers that the additional piece you had to add on is going to match. These, these major reconstructions we do so rarely. Um, for that Thank reason, <laughs> for that for that reason, it's like, and they're not fun on our end. I don't yeah. want to do it. Who who wants to spend that much money? And there's going to be ways you can tell it's been adjusted, not just even if even if even if the color on your your kilt hasn't faded in some way or been affected, and the new piece is a perfect match. There's going to be little ways. I mean, maybe it'll be so subtle you won't notice, but a kilt maker certainly would. And if somebody with a real fine eye for detail would notice, like, hey, this has been altered and adjusted. And Agreed. Certain things, and I will so. say, I will say one more thing from from a, from a juju perspective, is if you sell your kilt for half of your cost, effectively, is generally what they're going kind to of sell for on eBay or on you know, on a kilt forum or whatever. Um, you're creating two kilts to be out there in the world and you're helping someone who's getting into wearing a kilt at a cheaper price versus ripping yours apart and redoing it and hoping it works. So we're creating kiltflation. <laughs> we're creating, <laughs> no, what's the, uh, it, it's it's good karma. Yeah. Mac, you wanted to add something. Yeah, he, uh, Cameron is still, uh, is still following along with us live. Um, so he's he's saying about so the the ones with the straps and buckles have a three inch adjustment is what we're saying. Yeah. Um, he's also curious. He said about the the Velcro, how much adjustment is there? And he he said he's already lost ten pounds so far. I apparently found that. And then um, <laughs> so he's committed, is what Good. he's saying. Good. Um, so also ten pounds can come off of two different guys the same way. 
if two guys, and we're not the same height, but if we were the exact same height and the exact same weight and we both lost 30 pounds, he might lose it all in the gut, whereas I lose... Or in my head. <laughs> I might lose it all over and we have a different result. And that's yep. hard to predict too, especially if you haven't gone through massive cycles of gain and loss and gain and loss, where you might have some more predictability if you've done that. So, I mean, we get this all the time. Pe customers who, I'm losing weight. Can you make it a little smaller? I'm losing weight. You know, call you know, call me before you make it. And what I've found is maybe 50% lose more than half an inch, inch tops. Some people do. It happens. So yeah. what I'm, I guess my final mm. answer for me is you're going to have to take a long look in the mirror and examine your own history and what you think you're capable of and what your level of stick to is. Are you going to follow through? And I can't tell you if you're going to or not. I just don't. I, I don't know. Cam Cameron, you said? I don't know you, Cameron, or anybody else who's in, you know, kind of in the same, same space. I've seen people stay the same. I've seen people gain weight even after they told me they were going to lose weight. So yeah. don't ask me to make it massively smaller, assuming you're going to hit the mark. Yeah, it's the moving target thing. The yeah. other way to go is get one now. So you have, get you a have... fat kilt and a skinny kilt. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. No, but for for but when you get skinny, kilt. you don't want to you don't want to get rid of the f if if you have a fat kilt that you know you can go back into. That's that's that bad juju. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of skinny kilts that I'm going to get back into, I swear. I still have my first kilt, my wedding kilt. I'm <coughs> going to fit into it one day, I swear. Yes, it doesn't matter that half the apron is showing. It's fine, no, really. Um, the for a, for a kilt with Velcro, you can just add more Velcro, but at some point the, the front apron is a lot less than half, so yeah. it's, it's not great as an option. It's not horrible, but it's not great. It's maybe less... It's less too much. major reconstruction than a wool kilt would be, but it's still some reconstruction, still a pain in the butt. Um, yeah, so you're, but it's, but you start off at a lower price anyway, so even less pain in the butt is still going to be a fifty dollar, you know, yeah, you know, thing to go through, and that's what you get get for it on eBay. So you sell it and buy a new one, and you're skinny yourself. So it's. What would you say to a resolution where you, you buy a less expensive model kilt? Like if you were thinking about an 8-yard kilt, maybe you get a semi-traditional kilt for now. And once you've lost the weight and you've demonstrated you're going to stay there, then you get the 8-yard kilt. It depends what you're losing weight for. If you're losing weight for your wedding, yeah, maybe fair. you want the wool kilt for your wedding. If you're just losing it just for fun or because your doctor says you're going to die because you're fat, Wow, Cameron, I would not say that about you. I don't know why I'm <laughs> saying such mean the, things. Um, no, because you're pre-diabetic and you need to lose weight. Uh, but it's the you know it's it depends on the reason. Yeah. yeah. Fair. Yeah, there's different ways to tackle this problem. Indeed, a lot of them are hard to uh, tell you which is the right move. So strap on your helmet, tackle accordingly. All right, Ian, <laughs> you're up next. Okay. Let's talk about Patrick Rezek. Rezek? Sure. I'm going with Rezek. Patrick, Patrick Rezek. So Pat. Next question. He says, I've started to build my own collection of kilt accessories and only have a cardboard box to keep them in. When you start to build your collection of accessories, what is a good way to store the items? Do you hang up the belts and sporns? Do you roll or fold the socks? Do you have a jewelry box for the smaller items like kilt pins? What might you suggest for these items we don't think about taking care of? Sure. We think about taking care of them. <coughs> yes. What are, you, what are you talking about here? Okay, Patrick. so how do we take care of our kilt kit, as it were? Um, Mac, when you are ready, bring yourself in for this one. The um, How I personally do it. For my kilts, I hang them up. I have the our, our four-clip kilt hangers that I hang them all up in the closet. You know, insert commercial here. Must be 18 or older to call. The um, So that takes care of the kilts themselves. For the sporins, I used to actually um, hang them from a hook in my closet. Um, you know, I would attach the sporin chain to the exact right size and hang them in the closet. What I found was hanging them over time, the the leather pass through, for lack of a better term, on the back of the sporin would kind of you know kind of get like wings on it. So I ended up stopping doing that, and I just either store them flat on the shelf or in the box. In the case of uh, uh, dress borns. I actually keep them in the box that I have them in, um, just so that they're they're nice, compact, no dust, no nothing, back at the closet. Um, for kilt belts and my regular belts, I have a uh, a, a tie thing. Oh, okay. Um, 
it's basically a, a metal hanger and it with a with a long skinny thing and then a bunch of little arms coming off of it so you're supposed to hang a tie over each thing but on the end it's like a, a curly cue on the end to keep the ties inside so i just hang my belt hooks on that so i have multiple belts hanging there do you have so many belts you need a solution like that how many, how have, many belts you got i'm curious now i've got two i have three inch and a half jeans belts okay black I have one inch and a half jeans belt, no, two in brown. I have two dress belts, and then I have um, three, two black kilt belts, one black and brown kilt belt that we used to sell, and then I have one brown kilt belt. Okay. And one oxblood one to match the straps on my oxblood tweed kilt. So okay. I get a good number of belts. Um, so yeah, I keep them organized there so that they're all hanging from the same thing. Um, Cufflinks, kilt pins, I have in a small jewelry box in the closet and belt buckles. I generally, I probably have two or three more than I have kilt belts. So I have some on the kilt belts and some, you know, on the shelf, like kind of tucked away near the sporns. Okay. Oh, socks. My wife does the laundry in the house. <laughs> so they're just kind of jammed in a drawer. Um, well, two drawers, if I'm fair, if I'm honest. Um, and then for spore and flashes, I have a tall, skinnier, a, a shorter, skinnier drawer on the top of my dresser. And that's where all my flashes kind of live in there. And let me tell you, my wife loves when I get up at 4.30 or 5 in the morning and then with a flashlight go through the different drawers, <laughs> trying to find two matching socks so I don't embarrass myself throughout the day, and then trying to pull out of the drawer and putting lumps of kilt flashes up on the top of the dresser to dig through and find the two that actually match. I know this phenomenon well. Yes. Fortunately, my wife sleeps through the flashlight process. Oh, no. No, 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 no. No. My wife, it's, she will come to bed and, like, kick and scream and kick doors open and brush her teeth and all that, like, at the top volume of thing, of a brushing volume. Yes. You brushing volume. volume. Yes, volume of brushing. She will... <laughs> As much noise as she wants. Now, look, I'm a heavy Thank sleeper. Thank goodness she does not watch this. I don't care if she does or not. This is true. But me, like a, a, a mouse could piss in a cotton ball across the house, and that woman would wake up. It's, There's it's, a graphic for them to do. Yes. <laughs> As marketing team, please get on putting together that, uh, <laughs> that video package. Yes. <laughs> So me in the morning, what are you doing? Why are you so loud? Why are you so much noise? Like, shh, just be quiet. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Ian. <laughs> Mouse pissing in the cotton ball. Yes, I went there. Fortunately, <laughs> my wife sleeps through anything and everything. She could fall asleep with the lights on. I don't understand it. And we don't have the same products. I'm a light sleeper too. So if she would, if if I had to put up with what you apparently have to put up with, it'd be a massive problem. Fortunately, I don't sleep that much. That's how I resolve this problem. I go to bed hours after my wife does, and I get up at least an hour or two before she does. <laughs> but that's not the question. <laughs> no, I'm one. Sli I'm, I'm like half a step above a narcoleptic. Um, I can fall asleep yes, like that. Dude. I, I got a flashlight out in the morning trying to find the matching flashes uh, and that kind of stuff without turning on all the lights, even though it doesn't bother. I should just turn on the lights. I don't know. This is turning into therapy too quickly. Um, I'm sitting on the couch talking to my, my therapist, Rocky. Um, I, I actually, to answer the question, I need to answer this question for myself because I've been in recently increasing my volume of sporins and belts and things like that uh, with changing things in my life. So I don't have great... <laughs> Storage. I don't. We're not. We're not following up with the video package and showing Ian's closet and how he's figuring things out. Um, when I first started, yes, I had like a, a Rubbermaid container, a little better than a cardboard box that slid under the bed. Current bed doesn't fit that container, and there's still IKEA. Good place for rubber yeah. containers. Cheap. There's 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 still a container and it still has things in it. I don't think I've opened it in six months though because it has things I don't wear anymore. <laughs> but kilt hose are just in my socks drawer. I've got a, a section for there. Um, I've got a shelf in my dresser. Like there's there's drawers down below, but there's just shelves up above. And the top shelf has sporins and belts and buckles and things. And I've got too many things for the shelf. It's not a great storage solution. So it's kind of a mess. I need to figure it out. I know. Um, 
friend of the show, Captain Ron, who's been featured before for some of his odd kilts. Um, he uses the box system like you do. I think he's all of his spawns and boxes and they're labeled so that they can be stacked nicely. And that might work better for me because then I can go higher on the shelf without just creating a, a ball of a rat's nest right. of sporin chains. <laughs> now, if you if you have a lot of sporins, mm -hmm. here's here's a hack for the same you. Same thing. If you have a lot of sporins, you can get one of those. Like they generally make them out of like canvas or cotton material. Um, shoe yes. racks for the back of the door. If you get them wide enough. You can get them and just put your sporins in there on the back of the door. I was just um, about to bring that up, and I've wanted to do that, but I don't have a good door for that because my door op is in the corner of a room, and it opens up against the wall. You wouldn't be able to open the door all the way. Okay. So it doesn't work for me, sliding but... sliding door would be bad, too. Made for you. Yeah. yeah, the closet doors are sliding doors in my case, yeah. so, yeah. Mac, do you have any insight here? So I, I have a similar <coughs> similar thing with you, well, you with the with mice, mice peeing on cotton balls yes, everywhere exactly. in your house. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll I'll say this. I start off. I get my stuff ready the night before, so I, do I don't I don't do the fumbling through everything. Does your mommy come over and lay it out on the bed? No, for you? I I I start with my hat and work my way down. Um, <laughs> that is the, the hat least, is the corner piece. That of is the, the least surprising thing you could have said. <laughs> yep. Most so, uh, I think start with the kilt. <laughs> I, I think he would start with the socks. Even though it's tucked into the shoe, the man would still match it, his socks. I think, I think he'd go shoes first and then socks. It, okay. It's hat, then socks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, don't follow Max. Mm. Okay, go ahead, Mac. But I have a tie. I have a tie, the, the rounder one. Okay. On the back of my door. And I have sporns alternating with the belts okay. on there. Okay. Um, I have a three tier drawer that you can get like the plastic ones you can get like I was gonna say Kmart but there's none yeah. of them around anymore, but Walmart or whatever. Um, and I have all the all the kilt hose in there. They're rolled up and paired up next to each other. And then I have a small Tupperware rubber made thing on top that has all the flashes. Okay. And then I have another one that has ties that are all nightly nice. Rolled up, rolled up, yeah, and in color, color oh, order. little rainbow in the closet. Yeah, exactly. Oh, so cute. <laughs> so, because I don't have the best storage system, <clears throat> on days when I'm on on time, or at least on time for when I'm expecting to be here, it's because I set everything out the night before. I do do that <laughs> frequently. I did it for today because knowing <laughs> that I was, you know, had to look had to look pretty good for the show today. Yeah, the days when I'm like 15 minutes after I was expecting to be here, it's because I was doing it in the morning and predominantly yeah. with a flashlight. And yeah, the only time <laughs> the only time I lay stuff out before is if I have to remember to do something like oh. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna be on the show tomorrow. So put this shirt like hanging face out, or I have hockey tomorrow night. I gotta bring my cup and my you know the hockey jersey and my shorts and that kind of thing, so I don't forget to bring it in the morning. But just make sure none of the mice have peed in the cup. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's just <laughs> mine. It's fine. Mice all over their house apparently. It's a big problem. <laughs> Indeed. All right. That was you or Mac. That was, that was you. me, Mr. Mac. Alrighty. So any rats in the audience who wanna talk about peeing in cups? <laughs> Let's go to the Twitch. Twitch. So we have Wolf Warden asking. He's or he's first. He's gonna sell us. He's a longtime YouTube watcher, but now he's switching over to Twitch for this one, and he's new to watching the videos live. Okay. Nice. He'd like to know how often do the mills cycle through PV tartans. Um, he's trying to decide which one he wants, but he wants to get it before it disappears. Um, so he's nice. concerned. <coughs> concerned about cycles that. through. Right. Yeah. First objection is with one letter. It's a letter S at the end of mill. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's only one mill that we use for the mm -hmm. uh, polyviscous cloth. Um, for, it's it's a weird one because the mill that weaves the fabric and the PV material, um, they don't they don't add to the range much. They, they've subtracted from the range, but not too much over time, like a reasonable amount. Um, but the ones that are, we're one of those, we're a weird company in that we don't just offer, you know, hey, here's the, you know, 68 or 74 or whatever it is, um, tartans that the mill offers. We actually do the American Heritage, you know, the Celts and Culture Tartan, Celtic Nations. We do a couple, I would say, how many do you think we do like custom tartans for ourselves in, from, uh, in PV? 15-ish? Uh, yeah, we're getting, yeah, we've got With a good amount. military. <clears throat> Yeah, that's four right there. Um, um, American Heritage. American Heritage, Ireland National, Irish Heritage, um, Celtic Nations, Albanock, KNC. 
Yeah. Then you get the Sterling family. Oh, yeah, the Sterling color tartans. That adds so, to the range quite a bit. Yeah, so yeah. 15, 20 probably yeah, now. Yeah, I'd say we're pushing a lot more than that now. Yeah, so there's a lot of tartans that we actually add to the range that our our specific designs they are woven just for us and when we weave those stocked by us only yeah stocked by us only but in order to get a reasonable price we have to order like 300 plus meters of fabric every time we do that um so there's not a lot that are risk. not a lot that are discontinued they did a uh, a culling if you will um a couple years ago they they stopped or discontinued about or so um or at least eight of the ones that we carried um so but they've they've been pretty consistent throughout the the life of us carrying stuff from the mill so i wouldn't be too too concerned about it um yeah if you have a question about it email us ask us hey how much do you have in stock um yeah. or is the mill going to discontinue this particular one i'm planning on ordering in the next six months um and or if you have like three or four that you're looking at ordering over time let us know and we'll we'll let you know what we got yeah emailing us directly if it's a specific tartan would be my answer to this specific person but yeah in general they don't change much no nope yeah good because i don't want to change the pictures on the freaking website <laughs> i don't want to try to match things that they do earlier i don't want to try to mix nope if it's I, something... I want to be consistent forever doing the same thing the the beauty of kilts is that there's not, it's not like fashion where every season they're coming out with a new thing and the thing that was out that was hot last year they stopped doing because yeah. it's not as cool this year or whatever. It's their tartan patterns. They're they've been around for years and years and years, so they're gonna kind of carry them through. But if it's one of our designs, we're gonna weave it enough that you know we can carry it through and kind of add to that history, if you will. Yeah. And we're going to want to keep stocking that if it's doing well. Yeah, exactly. And if it's not doing well, we're probably going to have it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. <clears throat> Indeed. All right, Mr. Ian. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about Mark Essery's question. He says, I recently purchased a Rampant Lion kilt pin. I own kilts in Highland Gray, Spirit of Bruce, Masonic, Blackwatch Weathered, Blackwatch, and will soon have Fraser Weathered. Knowing very little about ramp the, about the rampant lion, only that it was only to be flown by Scottish royalty, would it be wrong, a faux pas, or just downright offensive to wear it on any of these tartans? Okay, so the the lion rampant rampant lion, um, would you wear it as a kilt pin or other symbol on any of those tartans? Um, sure, no, it's not offensive. There's no there's no you know, faux pas here. There's no, you know, diabolical plan either. Um, it's just, it's a symbol of Scotland. So, yes, I would wear it. Um, as a tangential, you know, side note kind of thing, the term, typically it's, a lot of people use it like in the reverse order. It would be lion rampant because it's a heraldic thing. So it would be the actual animal and then rampant or salient or dormant it's those are all heraldic terms to describe the posture of the lion whether it's you know one hand up two hands up all four feet down laying down sleeping whatever it is passant um there's several different terms in uh heraldry that would describe the position of the animal but typically it's animal first position second is there a distinction between its use as a flag versus its use elsewhere? Because I know the flag theoretically should only be flown by royalty, but the it, or symbol to show itself. that the royals are in residence at Holyrood or whatever. Right. Um, right. I I don't make that distinction. I don't know many people who would. Okay. And it's one of those so few so few people would make that distinction. I don't think it's mm -hmm. ever going to be a problem. Might it it's be a bit comparable to certain aspects of our own American flag code where people are out there violating the flag code left and right in terms of using flags in places that our flag code would say you shouldn't, even as they're expressing their patriotism? Um, a, no. Mm -hmm. B, most of the people, the flag code is interpreted slash misinterpreted by a lot of people, period. 
So it's agreed. It's not, <laughs> it's not. It's the flag code is not making things from a flag, mm-hmm. not in the spirit of a flag. Yeah. So there's a lot of, especially Americans, who would misinterpret what flag code means. Yeah. In Scotland, because we've Which actually is not had the same this. As law. Correct. Um, and in Scotland, we've actually had this discussion before, and I had a, a big, long discussion with uh, Bill, the, the managing director or the sales manager at House of Edgar. They don't have a flag code because mm-hmm. we talked about like the saltire kilt, the big X, like woven into the fabric on that's that's when you pleat it up has a big X on the back of the kilt, and his point was like how many miles of fabric they had woven and this is a hot seller way back when and they've like they've sold a ton of these things and my point back then was it would be a little different here in america where we wouldn't necessarily want to sit on the flag yeah um but his point was in scotland there is no flag code it's like why would you care about that you're just showing the saltire um where americans read more into the symbolism of it Typically, is that distinction the difference between where the salt tier is a national flag but not a country flag, whereas for the United States it is both national and country flag? Sure. Okay. <laughs> salt tire. Yes. Yeah. Um, the no, I, no, I I don't think it is. Okay. It's it's just a hard. We don't have that. Give a f. <laughs> period mm-hmm. it's that's not something that they concern themselves with versus in america it's written down and there's there's something there and we kind of yeah. feel it versus over there they just it, no it's just that it's it's a flag who cares okay. um yeah fair enough indeed all right fair enough. mr mac all right this one is right up your alley <laughs> Right, here's the alley. That, right, that hand right up your alley. Nervous. <clears throat> oh. Dakota is asking, would you gentlemen kindly give me some ideas for a casual date outfit? Date. Okay. Date. <laughs> Going on a date. You've come to the wrong place. <laughs> yes, old married man. Yes, Rockies has. I got the hot trends, you know, the snapper. <laughs> Here we go. Um, How long have you been with your wife? When was the last time you went on a first date? <laughs> Does that answer have to be longer or shorter than when I've been with my wife? <laughs> I'm pleading Ken, the fifth. You are lucky. She does not watch this <laughs> I know, show. She doesn't. Um, the um, casual, 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 casual date, date outfit. Um, is it a blind date? Is it a did they meet online? Is this the first yeah. time they're ever going out? I, is it? I need more data, man. We don't. You're, we don't. We you're just hamstringing only, me. This is the only data that I got. What's his name? Dakota. Dakota, quick, get back in the comments. Tell us, is this a blind date? Have you known the person long? Do you work with them? And this is just like the first date outside of work uniform. Yeah, all these questions um, matter. Now I gotta know, and it's gonna be a thirty-second freaking delay. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, what would I wear for a casual? date let's assume certain things how casual are we talking casual can be a broad range of things here. yeah are we talking like going to the pumpkin patch on <laughs> halloween are we mcdonald's or is it like just you know eh, it's a it's a nice a kind of restaurant all right pub yeah fair okay um if i'm going to a pub it's uh... all right all right go ahead. i had to look back in the comments i did find another one for him okay it says we're going down to the river in a van down by the river? And then they're going for dinner. Okay. Okay. Down by the river's vague. That could be a nice walk on a so paved is, trail, but yeah, it can so also is, be under so a bridge. Out for dinner. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. I all right, here's here's my here's my easy overarching advice. Dress for the event as you would if you were wearing pants, but insert kilt. Yeah. So if I'm going to a pub and a, a reasonable pub, like a micro pub, has some nice beers. Dinner is, you know, twenty ish dollars a plate. Yeah. Then I would wear. If you're getting maybe, a burger, it has fancy ingredients you wouldn't normally find on a burger. Yes, yeah. there's some kind of fancy cheddar cheese, like, not just like Velveeta. There's like Gruyere. In that instance, I would maybe maybe a polo or a Henley shirt or something a little bit nicer. I would wear with a kilt. I would 
probably wear kilt hose and a pair of wingtips maybe with that. Okay. Um, if it is a, a you know, the, the local watering hole Irish pub where, you know, it's, it's $2 wing night, um, then I would probably just wear a my fanciest T-shirt um, <laughs> without the holes. Um, so what Max's doing? Exactly, my Piper Alley T-shirt. I would wear an appropriate level of formality and just insert the kilt instead of pants. Okay. Your thoughts? I might I might go a pinch more dress because it is a date and you're trying to make a good impression. <sighs> yeah, I don't. Care I mean, about you, you certainly don't want to wear a Prince Charlie for a walk down by the river and uh, you know the the fancy pub in town. Um, like this is maximum, maximum level of dress. You know what I mean? But maybe this. I mean, I went out with my wife. We did. Would a late... you wear that to walk down by the river? I mean, it really depends on how long a walk we're talking about here. If we're talking about what an all kind afternoon, of river? is there like mud or yeah. is there a trail? Th- this matters. This matters. If it's an all afternoon hike, no, absolutely I'm not dressing like this. If it's, you know, a 20-minute a twenty minute walk, you know, along a paved trail that just happens to be along the city's riverfront. And there's shops on the other side of the street. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah. Then perhaps, depending on the time of year, of course. If it's the a middle, leisurely stroll. If it's August in Pennsylvania, I'm not dressing like this outside anywhere. <laughs> but yeah, somewhere on a spectrum from polo shirt to this. Tweed, tie, tee, dress shirt. You know, smart, casual. It depends on the date too. If I'm, if I'm, some of those questions we asked earlier. If yeah, I'm going to go out on a date with a punk rock chick or a goth chick, I'm not going to dress in a polo or like you, you dweeb. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be more comfortable. I'm going to dress. It depends on how, on I would how normally well. You, dress. Go, back, go back to one of those other questions. I was like, how well do you know the person you're going out on this first date with? Is it a friend that you're kind of escalating, or a co-worker, or is it a blind date? If it's a totally blind date and you've never met this person, maybe your friend set you guys up, maybe they know, you know nothing about them, they know nothing about you. A kilt's a strong flavor. It's it's like spicy food in that way. Like some women, a guy in a kilt, oh my goodness, I hit the jackpot. Some women are like, ooh, gross, a guy in a kilt? Now, none of those women are watching probably. So let's let's lean into the first thing. <clears throat> okay. But, you know, you're, you're, you're making a bold move and a bold move isn't necessarily bad. I, I, would, I would go a step further. Here's what I would say. I would dress how I would normally dress. I would not Fair. put on airs. I Fair. would do what I am going to do. I Fair. would not pretend to be someone I am not to impress someone who I don't know if is going to like me or not. If I put on airs, if I put a fake persona out there and the person f- likes that person, you know, over several dates, falls in love with that person, then, and I'm not that person, it, it, it's the reason why we do this show I am the same in person, more caffeinated, more scotch than I am in person. But I am the same person right here than I am in my office, than I am in the store, than I am in production. Because I don't want to be fake. I want to be the same person that I am all the time because it's too much freaking energy to be two different people at the same time. Yeah. I'm going to be who I'm going to be. And if she likes that, great. She likes it. We mesh. Boom, done, clicked. If she does it, next. Yeah. Don't overthink it. Yeah. From that perspective. I think where I'm going to come down on this is, if you're watching the show, you probably have an interest in kilts. It's at least in some way, maybe a little, maybe a lot, part of your lifestyle. If you show up to a first date in a kilt, whether it's with a polo or with a you know shirt, tie, tweed, and she's not into it, you just found that out from the jump. You saved yourself two more dates for finding out that she's <clears throat> that you're not going to be into her because she and doesn't if you're like paying, your lifestyle. You saved yourself money. Or if you show up on the first date in a kilt because that's part of what you're into and she's into it, you found that out that much faster. Yeah, it's something you. No matter whether it's kilt or whether it's um, you know, it, if you wear your little Star Trek pin or your or your Star Wars pin because you like that on your jacket, or you wear your you know your rocker panel because you're an MC, or you wear your favorite band T-shirt, whatever it is, be who you are. Yeah, that is what actually matters, and then figure out 
if it's a good mix. Yeah. Don't be someone fake for two reasons. One, you're saving yourself time and money and agita. Two, you're saving them time and money and agita. You're, if they think you are one person and then you reveal yourself to be something else later on, they're going to be annoyed with that and they're going to feel like you're doing something weird and different. Just be who you are. Yeah. The right people will find you. You will attract the right people and the right people will attract you. It's yeah. People overthink this stuff too much. There is a hole for every thing. There's a tab A for a slot B. I don't know. Hey. It's every... <laughs> I'm, okay. I'm stopping right there. Okay. But the, <laughs> I broke Mac. <laughs> I don't know if that's the metaphor you want to use there. Well, uh, I, don't know. I, I don't know what they're looking for from their first date. It is the metaphor. Don't know what they're looking use. for. <laughs> that's third date, Ian. Third date. I mean, it's a, I, I don't. I don't know. Connor was it? No, Cameron. But the point is, just be who you are, and mm. the right people will find you. If you are a fake, then the, the wrong people will find you, and then you're going to have problems. If you're thinking about it this hard in advance, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna jump out on a, a limb here and suggest maybe you're somebody who is a little nervous, you're not sure what to talk about on a first date. Sometimes, if that's the case, the kilt's a great conversation start. It'll be something to talk about. Yeah, might be good, might be bad, but as we already talked about, you're gonna find something out. Dakota has responded. Dakota, I was way off. Cameron has a different question. Entirely. He's like, I'm guessing this is about my question. She already knows that he wears kilts and loves it. Good. Okay. Wear a kilt. Hundred percent. Be who you are, wear a kilt, wear yeah. whatever you're comfortable in, whatever the, the, the level of restaurant or, or walk down by the river requires, whether mm -hmm. it's hip waders or whether it's hiking boots or whether it's wing yeah. trips, wear the right thing for the event, be who you are, yeah. consequences be damned. You'll figure it out and she'll figure it out and that's the point. Yeah. You want to be long term, you want to be with the right person and the right person is going to love you for who you are, not who you pretend to be. That's the most earnest thing you've ever said on the show, Rocky. Nowhere near the most earnest, but it's, it's one of them. <laughs> it's a beautiful sentiment. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next, Mr. Ian. Okay. I think we may have one more for you and one more for Mac. Yeah. Let's what? see. Okay. In let's case see. emergency, break glass. Let's do that one. Uh, let's talk uh, about David Donworth's question. David Donworth, who I know happens to have this same kilt that I'm wearing here. Same tartan, anyway. Not the same kilt. That'd be weird. We don't share kilts. David and I don't share kilts. Don't, don't worry about that. Don't ask questions. Roommates? No, we don't even Awkward. live in the same state. Yeah. Um, so I guess this yeah. is a question primarily for Ian and Mac, which makes me nervous because I haven't thought about this question enough in advance. Um, your favorite Ian and Rocky moment from the, from either the show or in real life. So he says, on or off screen, what's your favorite Ian and Rocky or Mac and Rocky moment? I'll let you go first, Mac. How do you feel? <coughs> what, what do you got? Well, there's there's several stories right. that we could go with, but <laughs> we've, we've accumulated over curious, time. Are you gonna are you gonna look for the the best <laughs> Mac Mackie and Rock moment? Or are you going for the best Ian and Rocky? Are, are we trying to do each other? or Are we doing ourselves here? Um, I, I was gonna go for Mac Rocky. Okay, fair enough. Um, helps helps me figure and out and formulate a response for, here. <laughs> for context, Mac, when did you start? Two thousand. Nine, eight? Eight-ish, somewhere okay, in that somewhere ball. Well, it's, it's, eight was when it became official full-time. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Seven, eight, somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay. So Max knew me for a while. They were co-workers before they started dating. Yeah. <laughs> we hold hands uh, and skip across the street to Wawa. <laughs> down um, by the river. There, there, there's, there's, definitely, there's definitely a trip to Ohio that we, we could... <laughs> but that one we can't bring up on air. Um, <laughs> Getting pulled over by the cops. Yeah, that was well. That's that's another trip to Ohio. Yeah, that's part of the trip to Ohio. Yeah. Um, so th there's those. I'm slamming my hand in the door. Um, the uh, remove hand before closing door. <laughs> Mental uh, note. Also, um, good advice for a first date. I, I think I'm gonna go back to the Phoenixville store. Okay, Phoenixville. The Phoenixville store, and, and there's there's another one from the Phoenixville store that we can't do either. Um, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> but. There was there was an instance where I, I had to leave the production room because it was getting a little little heated back there between Rocky Rocky and Kelly and, and I had to go. We never fight. I, it wasn't, it, but it wasn't a, it wasn't necessarily a fight that caused the heat. The heat. It was the scissors, the location of the scissors <laughs> where she had on her gone. machine, and then went into the <clears> elbow. <throat> made made a pocket of sorts. Yes. And we were discussing how to fix how to how to. to the patch it with needle and thread. My wife used to keep an embroidery scissors, like a little tiny scissors. It was about like that long overall, right on the like on the knob on the top of her machine. 
and she turned and she turned back and put it her elbow right into it and it just made a, a small v-shaped pocket eh, half inch three quarter inch deep a puncture in her elbow well. yes <laughs> we won't call it a puncture wound quite yet yes so we knew we had hydrogen peroxide in in, in the building in the building so we were going to not great on puncture wounds well we figured that out later it's fine, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> So we decided that wounds damage. need to be cleaned out. So hydrogen peroxide is a good solution to this. Yes. So her screaming and kicking at Rocky, I was like, I'm gonna go in the store. And then Sue, Kelly's mom, who was working with us at the time too, are, are in the bathroom with Rocky, trying to pour the hydrogen peroxide. And Holding I'm out Kelly there still. <laughs> and I'm out there with customers, and they're like just staring in the back, going, "What is going on?" I'm like, "That's fine." We're good. To be fair, that happened a lot with Kelly. Just what's going on back there? <laughs> yes, screaming. I remember uh, telling her, you know, and her trusting me for some reason, <laughs> that that pouring hydrogen peroxide in this puncture wound was going to clean it out and be fine. And holding her elbow over, she's like, are you sure? Are you sure? Over the sink. I'm like, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. And I'm pouring it in. And she's like, it burns. It burns. I'm like, it's fine. And she's kicking me as I'm trying to pour it in. <laughs> And Max in there, like, fielding questions from customers. Like, no, 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 they're fine. They're fine. Marital well, spat. You should wear this kilt on the first day. Ah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Memories. Memories. All right, Mr. Ian. I mean, obviously my answer here has to be my favorite Ian and Rocky moment is the part where I pestered you for seven years until you finally made the Celtic Nations muted tartan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It became it became a fun running joke. Yeah. That I wasn't going to do it. And then I decided that hey, I should do that. I'm yeah. I'm sure I'm sure there's better stories here, but I'd have to think about it longer. A lot of mine and Rocky's relationship is just low key, you know, you know, long running jabs at each other. Uh, which doesn't make for great storytelling. Um <laughs> <laughs> Great idea to insult your boss on a regular basis. It's really endearing. I'll become store, store manager one day. <laughs> um, um, the look on Rocky's face when I came back after he gave me homework early in my career here, and I went came back and said, "I don't know, Tombstone was fine." Say what? <laughs> kind of like that look. Wait, I didn't know what like, you said. I was like, when I just said, "You know, Tombstone was kind of fine as a movie. It's fine." <sighs> The movie Tombstone is a theatrical masterpiece, for the record, and the most quotable movie ever. If you have not seen the movie Tombstone, Val Kilmer, Oscar-worthy performance, robbed, period. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. <laughs> it's, it, is, it is up there with quotables with Boondock Saints 1. I'm your Huckleberry. Indeed. It's a very quotable movie. Yes. And yes. it's good. It's good. No. I'm sure of it. I hate him. He's never watched a movie. I asked him to watch. <laughs> you do all bad movies. I don't care about your movies. You're dumb. Tombstone, best movie ever. Why would I watch anything else? Best movie. I watched it that one time. It was good. All right. Indeed. Indeed. Okay, enough creepy Rocky stories. <laughs> <laughs> having cleaning out wives let's, wounds. Let's, let's let's move on to artistic Rocky stories. Yes. All right, Mr. Mack, you will have the last question of the day. Then we have to think of a question of the day, and I haven't thought of one yet. <laughs> All right, I'm looking through the questions here. You can think of a question of the day because I haven't thought of one. I've kind of got one. But that's okay. one I already told you. I hope that's one's okay. Okay, that's fine. We'll figure it out. Chris is asking. How do you feel about wearing Aaron sweaters with kilts? <clears throat> Aaron sweaters with kilts is fine. Yeah. It's yeah, I do it on a regular basis, um, or in some kind of cable knit. Um, Aaron sweaters being you know from the island of Aaron, but you know you can wear any kind of cable knit sweater with it. Um, yeah, it's a nice look. Um, when I wear a, I will add this caveat: when I wear an Aaron knit sweater, a try to make sure it's not too long so it doesn't cover the top of the sporn. Or if it's a little bit long, make sure you're tucking it behind the flap of the sporn. You do not have to wear a belt when you're wearing it with a sweater. Um, but, yeah, I do it a lot in the winter. I wear sweaters. I don't have a good Aaron or even a really good cable knit sweater. But that's something I've been meaning to change. Maybe this, this coming fall or winter, that's something I'll, I'll correct. I'm certainly not going to be wearing any heavy sweaters between now and 
September, though. <laughs> no, <laughs> not I in Pennsylvania. Too much. Nope. <laughs> maybe, maybe they do it in Scotland or Ireland, but not not here. Those people. Those. <clears throat> All right, Ian, we'll do one more. One more? Because Max was quick. Okay, I'm going to try to find the question really quick that was related to the question of the day that I had in mind. Um, Stephen Waldrop, I'm new to wearing the kilt and trying to learn as rapidly as possible. We appreciate that. I would like to hear some tips on how to minimize the amount of stuff I carry in order to fit the essentials into my sporin. I also have a belt bag but don't wear it with pullover sweater, related to that last question, and with a vest that limits my carrying capacity. Thanks, and keep up the great work. Thank you, Stephen. Cheers. Fabulous question. <clears throat> when I've always been a reasonably minimalist thing carrier, item carrier, um, I have never been the guy to need the, the, you know, the man bag or backpack you know, to carry all of the stuff all the time. The only time I wear a backpack is when I go hiking to carry my lunch. Um, the doesn't hydrate enough. No, not not nearly enough hydration. Um, I'm hydrating with coffee and scotch. <laughs> it's fine. Um, yeah, it's when I. But I will say this: when I started wearing kilt, I did carry um, a regular sized wallet, maybe a little bit thick. Um, you know, with business cards and 27 credit cards and, you know, a couple of receipts in there. Not George Costanza letter, not, not George Costanza <laughs> level of wallet thickness exploding. <laughs> I used to smoke back then, so I'd carry smokes. Mm. I'd carry my keys, carry a pen, carry business cards, carry a wallet. And all that, you know, was, you know, a th thick honk and sporing. Um, Hard to get at everything, especially like in the moment. Yeah. Um, so I feel a little self-conscious if I'm at the at the Wawa or, or somewhere. I'm sitting there like digging in my spore and I'm in, like in line because like, I, I don't yes. like to carry a lot of things. No, what I what ended up happening was like if I wanted to pay with cash, I would have to take things out of my spore and, and put it on the counter or on mm. the bar to get to the thing I want because it went down to the bottom. No bueno. <clears throat> exactly. So I kind of I've evolved into much more of a minimalist. So now I will have a phone. With a with my like two credit cards in the back of the phone, and I'll have a money clip with you know fifty bucks or whatever it is. Um, so I'm not really carrying much, even to the point of like my keys. I will carry a car key on a separate ring from my store and all other keys. So if I don't need all the other keys, I just bring my car key with me. I will carry as little as possible anywhere so i don't have to deal with all this stuff yeah if you're wearing now if you're i will i will say this if i'm wearing a vest like ian has on now um a lot of times i will wear because my phone well my phone's in front of this camera going on the tickety talks but i have a note uh, uh, you know basically a taller phone so it's kind of tough to fit in my sporin sometimes or when i bend over it it pushes up and unsnaps the snap on the sporin so a lot of times when i'm wearing a a a uh, i need to carry my phone with me in the retail store downstairs or from out or something like that i'll put my phone in my pocket mm. of the vest and it sticks out the top looks a little unsightly but i don't really care because it's more utilitarian um so I'll do that to get some extra room, and I'll use the pockets on my vest. Um, but, yeah, that's about it. Hard disagree on phone and the vest. I, I see what you mean about being in Sporn. Um, if I put my, 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 my phone in here, the pockets on, on a kilt vest are not very deep. It my vest falls out. I specifically make them, when I have my vest, make them deeper pockets all the way down to the bottom. Yeah. Okay. So I've done that. Because I know I'm going to Wish you do hadn't that. said that out loud and where customers <laughs> can hear that. Um, yeah, it, my <clears throat> phone falls out 17 times. I actually tend to stuff it in the waistband a little bit. That tends to work out a little bit better for me. Uh, prior to being a, an everyday kilt wearer, I was a big wallet guy. I didn't have 27 credit cards like some people. But I had, like, photos of my kid and of my wife, who I love. Um, and I had this whole big honking wallet with, like, I had, a, I had, like, a coin in there for some reason. Like, a big, like, you know, like, dollar coin, coin in there for yeah, some yeah. reason. I don't know. I had tons of stuff in my wallet. It made no sense. Irish money? <laughs> I might go there. So I found, if, you know, when I, was an, when I became a, a couple times a year kilt wearer, 
I would, I'd leave the wallet at home. I'd grab like one or two key credit cards, my driver's license if I was going to be drinking because I was putting on a kilt I was probably drinking, and whatever cash I had, rubber band, or one of my wife's hair ties. Now I have my own hair ties, but I don't need to, I don't need to be subject to the tyranny of my wife's hair tie supply. Ad- admit it. You don't usually wear hair ties. He usually wears a scrunchie. That's... <laughs> um, I would do that as a temporary solution for the day. Yeah. Since I go back to wearing pants and my big honk and wallet. Um, since becoming an everyday kilt where I needed a better solution, I found, you know, something a little bit more yep. compact. No more pictures, no more random stuff. It's got cash, driver's license, the cards that I need. Uh, much better solution. Um, so I have tissues. If you can get down to, you know, your wallet that's compact and, and the you know, limited number of keys you need and your phone... What else? What else do you have to yeah. have? Yeah, it's ultimately think about it this way: What do you What do you actually use? Yeah. I mean, my money clip has a. I guess it depends on your lifestyle, but. Yes, but I have a, a utilitarian money clip. Uh, it has like a little measuring, a little tape measure on one side. Has a you know a flathead screwdriver. Has a can opener, bottle opener on the actual money clip. It's like a credit card shape. Now, if you have something like that, that takes care of the utilitarian type things you need it for. What do you need to, yeah, 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 something like that. What do you actually need to carry on a day-to-day basis that you've used in the last six months to year? And if you haven't used that key to your bike lock that's in the garage, rusted shut because you haven't used your bike in 27 years, do you need to carry it on your freaking keychain? No. So think about it that way and pare down what you actually need and just carry the stuff that you need just for weight purposes, if nothing else. I used a small hiking slash more like bicycling backpack for like a festival day where I was going to need more things. Yeah. It's a water bladder because I do hydrate. But <laughs> Filled with scotch. But yeah, yeah, but yeah it's fine. every day I need my keys, my phone, my wallet. And I'm yeah, good. that's it. Everything else I can carry. Yep. So what it boils down to, just be as minimal as possible. And, and if you're going to go out for a full day, maybe you need more. If you're going to go out for a date night and you need one credit card, maybe two, and cash and your car key, why do you need to bring more than that? You're going on a freaking date. Just leave the rest of the stuff at home. Yeah, exactly. All right. What if you need a hanky? There you go. (laughs) Thank you. I'm good. I have allergies. My allergies have been horrible this year, so I have some tissues much more. All right. Question of the day. What do you want to ask? Mine. So yep. re- related to that, so for those of you who are, you know, everyday kilt wearers especially, but anybody who wears a kilt, what is like the one thing that's in your sporn that you definitely don't need but has taken up space in there? So beyond the keys, the phone, the wallet, the obvious things, maybe a, a napkin. For me, the last few days, it has been something really dumb. My aunt was in town, and she gave me a whole fistful of atomic fireballs. <laughs> My sport has like a dozen atomic fireballs. It's not normal for me, but that is that is currently what is taking up too much space in my sport. <laughs> I, I, will, I will omit any ball jokes that I was about to insert there. I will just omit those from the show. But good question. What do you carry in your sport that you really don't need? Or feel like you do need. (laughs) Or feel like you need, but don't actually need. Or may not actually need. An EpiPen. I don't know. Um, Fair. So. You're telling people they don't need their EpiPen. (laughs) 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 All right, boys and girls. Let us know in the comments, what do you carry around with you in your sporn that you don't really need, but you carry it anyway. Until next time, boys and girls. Slanjava. From the other side I really hope that wasn't recorded But I know it was (laughs) Now it's forever We'll mock you (laughs) Till the end of time, my brother